CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. We have a full house. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is 631. I'm calling this meeting the Arlington School Committee to order. Today is Thursday, November 14th, 2024. Uh, I do not see any of the committee members uh, remote. Uh, Mr. Carr's not here yet, but I don't see him on the remote, so as long as we don't have... Oh, here's Mr. Cardin. So we are uh, a full committee tonight. We will not be requiring a roll call vote on everything because we've got a full house. Um, we have a full list of uh, people who have asked to speak under public comment. Uh, the rules for public comment are... we stage 30 minutes of public comment if you'd like to sign up to speak remotely or, or in person and we do give preference to in person or I do uh, the rules are you email Ms. Diggins at ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 6 p.m. Thursday on the date of the meeting and apparently a lot of people have done that um, depending on how many people sign up the time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each because I've got a long list of people I'm going to reduce the time allotment to two minutes um, I would encourage everybody because uh, everybody on the list is on the same topic and we heard a lot of folks on the same topic last time and we're going to have this as an agenda item tonight so uh, Repetition is not a good sign in, in working with an elected board, so uh, be interesting, uh, be concise, uh, and uh, make, make an effective case. Um, uh, so I will set, I, I have a timer that makes the sound of a Shinkansen train when, when you reach two minutes, if you hear the train go by. Uh, which is the train chimes. That means your time has expired. Finish your sentence and then step aside. And I will give you advance notice of who is speaking uh, so that the next person in the list will be ready to go when the previous person is off. First person will be Sarah Lamb Barton, who will be followed by Becca Gurner. When you get to the microphone, please identify yourself and your street address for the record. Go. Okay. Good evening, my name is Sarah Barton and I live at 57 Huntington Road. I have fifth and seventh graders at APS. Two years ago, I participated in the creation of mission and vision statements to reflect the core values of this district. Serving with me were several AHS students. One of them shared with me how he and all of his friends doubled up on math classes in pursuit of an advantage in the race for college admissions. He looked bewildered when I told him that my own high school had offered a grand total of two AP courses, yet I had thrived at a top tier liberal arts college and obtained a PhD at the University of Cambridge. This young man had never had anyone tell him that there are myriad paths to academic success beyond a frenzied quest for high school achievement. He was boxed in by the narrowness of his goals. I urge the committee to be thoughtful in addressing calls to accelerate the math curriculum. What are we telling our students with our actions? Why the rush to advanced math? To squeeze in more AP classes? AP classes are fine, but they don't replace the learning and intellectual maturity that occur in a university context. Nor should students feel that STEM careers are reserved for those who skip ahead at age 11 or 15 or even 18. But a depth of foundational knowledge, that does help. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics in a paper on catalyzing change in middle school mathematics says explicitly there is no race to calculus. Of course, students should have access to materials that meet their educational needs, including for challenge. But aptitude is not fixed. Students learn from all of their peers. And unconscious bias and structural barriers muddy the waters of tracking. I would prefer to see a solution happen within existing middle school classrooms. Thank you. Becca Gardner is next, who will be followed by Dennis Grodkowski. 
Good evening. My name is Becca Gerner. I live at 110 Wildwood Ave, and I have a second grader and a seventh grader in Arlington. I'm here today to present my perspective on acceleration as a math educator with 20 years of experience, none of which was in Arlington. I have taught math to sixth through eighth graders. I've tutored students in grades five through 12, so I'm very familiar with where students in middle are in middle school math and where they are going in high school. Um, I'd like to make two points. Firstly, it's very common for students who are high achievers in elementary math to become somewhat frustrated in sixth grade math. In middle school, the goal of math is no longer being quick with facts or calculations. Feeling like the fastest or the best math student in the class may have been a key part of the student's identity in elementary school, and it was likely rewarding for them to succeed in that way. But in middle school, we are beyond that. High achieving math students have often told me they feel bored because they're looking for the feeling they used to get when they were the best or the fastest. But in middle school, we are asking them to slow down, show their work, look for connections, and explore depth and breadth of topics as a challenge. These are crucial skills to build long-term success, but they don't provide the dopamine hit that those particular students would get with getting the answers the fastest. In addition, addre challenges addressing depth and breadth are work. There may not be a right answer to get. When offering this kind of challenge, I often hear from those students, that's not the kind of challenge I want, even though it may be the kind of challenge they need. Secondly, I'd like to address the role of extracurricular math classes in creating boredom. Extracurricular math classes, by their nature, are teaching skills and topics that students will be learning later in school. Therefore, when the school curriculum gets to that particular topic, the student will be bored because they already learned it elsewhere. In my experience, participating in extracurricular math classes actually creates boredom. Choosing to send one's child to one of these outside classes is also choosing for them to be bored in school. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Grudkowski, followed by Amit Shish. <clears throat> My name's Dennis Grykowski, and I'm, I live at 57 Wollaston Avenue, uh, apartment number two. Uh, I'm the father of Andre, Dimitri, and Victor Grykowski, who are in second, sixth and tenth grade. Um, I'm here just to give a little update. I, was, I spoke last time, just a little update. Um, things I've kind of noticed. Right, this week I went uh, to Dima and Andre's math teacher, uh, teacher Parent teacher conferences. Um, you know, I learned the boys had, were earning uh, A pluses for the quarter, and I was really happy. But I think that um, if this continues, because they're really, they find the material very easy, and every exam and t test and quiz they're getting A pluses. I'm concerned that um, the classes are too easy and um, that they're not going to be challenged. And if the whole year is, is like this, that their enthusiasm may uh, decline or diminish. Um, I've uh, discussed the equity and access with my older son, Andre, um, regarding his APS math experience. Um, the APS strategic priority plan speaks of ensuring equity and excellence in access to rigorous learning. Andre uh, feels he doesn't have access to the math classes that would push him, despite his high MCAS and IXL scores. Um, he thinks that prerequisites should be replaced by recommendations um, for paths forward. I think, uh, I think some districts have uh, pathways that allow students to ramp on and off of uh, different sort of learning paths based on the readiness and comfort. I think this approach supports a growth mindset and the confidence to challenge oneself as well as allowing kids to lay back if things get too hard, a safe zone to fail um, and succeed. I hope APS will create pathways to identify and develop advanced learners uh, from early, early, uh, elementary school onward uh, for a broader and more accessible curriculum uh, uh, that's sort of more open uh, for everyone. Um, it's more flexible. Um, I think the solutions that we hopefully arrive at um, are realistic. Um, consider time, accessibility, methodology, and uh, equity. Uh, student parents and guidance counselors need clarity on the academic paths early enough to prepare students and plan appropriately. The principles of a uh, challenge by choice should allow students to uh, adjust their paths as they go. Um, ideally, uh, beginning early. Um, you know, maybe this this uh, idea isn't of uh, isn't of Challenge by choice isn't known uh, by the students and parents so well, maybe, or maybe even all the um, uh, the ins and outs of the the program. Um, I just want to hope that a, um, some solutions come tr come forth that uh, benefit kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amit Shish and Jay Parlin will follow. <clears throat> Good 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Amit Shesh, and I live at 101 Orient Avenue. I'm a parent of a 10th grader and a 6th grader. A lot has been said specifically about the way the Math 6 bypass exam is conducted, so I will not go into it. Instead, let me talk about the consequence of this bypass mechanism for my daughter, who is currently the 10th grader. Mm -hmm. She took the exam in 6th grade and did not pass it. She subsequently took Math 6, Math 7A, and Algebra 1 in her 6th, 7th, and 8th grades, respectively. She scored 95% or above in all of them and consistently scored above her grade level in all IXL evaluations. This shows that despite not clearing the Math 6 bypass, her math capabilities accelerated in middle school. When she arrived at AHS as a freshman, she requested to be tested out for geometry. That petition was denied. She was... She then asked to be allowed to take Algebra 2 and Geometry together in her freshman year. That was denied as well. When she became a sophomore, however, she discovered that several of her fellow sophomores were allowed to double up on the same Algebra 2 and Geometry during sophomore year to catch up. So apparently students are allowed to do the same thing in 10th grade, what she was denied in 9th grade, even though she had taken the exact same Algebra 1 they did, but a year earlier. This does not just seem justifiable to me from a curriculum standpoint. Coming back to the Math 6 bypass, thanks to the current approach, an exam taken at the age of 10 is determining whether or not a student can take certain courses at the age of 16. There is no other way, no other chance. It seems that summer courses are now being proposed, so my daughter will have to take summer courses at the age of 16 to make up for a specific exam she took at age 10. I find that even the SATs do not have such far-reaching consequences. So here's what I ask. Please create multiple opportunities in middle school to accelerate math pathways and allow AHS freshmen to double up on math courses based on their performance in math in middle school. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to call up the Misuro Vasilev family together. You have four people on the list. I'm going to ask all four of you to come up to the microphone and expedite your discussion. I will give the four of you four minutes total. Okay. Well, thank you for having us here. Uh, we do not just rep represent the Vasiliev Missouri family. I've spoken to over 55 families. Yeah, everybody have a seat. Your you name can, and you address, can sit please. down. I know we are counting on time. We, I also have a handout that I hope will be handy. The, uh, administrator that we send out, will be happy to pass that it out. we sent before that response to a consolidated presentation, consolidated questions that are result of the presentation that's being presented at 8 p.m. today. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, a number of points were already said, so I won't repeat them. We do have three children, uh, age of eighth, sixth, and fourth grade, who is not here in the Arlington public school system. They all suffer in different ways from the fact that they are not challenged. You can see it on my daughter, who's going to speak. My son spoke, may I speak again, what, what, he, what it feels like. My fourth grader, I have to disclaim, he arrived in third grade, fourth grade. At this point, we put him in a private school. We took a loan out to put him in a private school because my son was completely disengaged from his class. He would come home and say, I just slept through the whole day. He's, he's bored, he's bored. He, like every single child responds differently. This one is crying, the other one is disengaged. This one is gonna speak for herself how she feels. Um, so we, we do ask to engage with us, the administration, as opposed to push us back. This is, these are our children. These are children. This isn't about who is right or wrong. The kids are speaking up. How can you put age discrimination on whether they can double up or not? These are kids. You see them around. Like, how can you? This isn't about arguing who is right, who is wrong. We are here, however busy we all are, is because it's so important to us. I stay up until 1 a.m. writing this with you know, a job. We, both have, we all have jobs. We pay taxes. We would ask you to please listen to the requests we have. We consolidated the list of asks and engage with us. Don't have a separate discussion. We get four minutes. The, the administration gets the, I mean, aren't you servants? Not of me, of my kids. So please, please listen to us. If our kids are asking for it, don't box them in. Go ahead, Evelina. Oh, um. Yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Oh, no. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can, I can say that, yes, this should be about the children, okay? We need to serve our children and not take the world of grown-ups who are oppressive. 
we become an oppressive force, that the mass department of Arlington is oppressive, restricting, and does, goes out of a way to restrict kids to learn math, which is, which is really counterproductive. Like, my level in math is way above the other, I don't want to disrespect the others, but, like, preschoolers. I am just so annoyed. Like, I could solve billions of these problems for a day and, like, not even break a sweat. Like, in the test, I was like, oh, my God, this is a test? I was like, no, this is not a test. I mean, like... Isn't it, like, our choice to, like, do, like, all of this? Like, I just want to be with my level, be with, like, be challenged, like, actually learn and not just, like, hide and just, like, be like, okay, this is this, this is, oh, my God. Um... So, yeah, I created a tree for my art project to represent that. The, the black and white um, stuff that represents the, the black and white um, dirt is representing what I'm trying to grow in. It's my wish for my future, but how am I supposed to think that I'm going to grow like this if I don't even get an education? School isn't giving me what I need. The school is for educating students, not putting them down that they can't do something. I feel wasted. I, uh, uh, please include I, your remarks. I have, I have big dreams. I, um, but and I want to do all sorts of things. I want to change the world in some way. But how can I expect to do that if I can't even learn how to do math correctly? The um, I want a good future for Jacob. I want a good future for me. I want a good future for everyone. I want everyone to change the world in whatever way they want. As, um, and, the, and they're talking about growth mindset. Well, the teachers are put, so, uh, certain teachers are putting us down. They're, they're saying, we can't do it. We, um, you're not good enough. But, on, but honestly, like, if, even if we weren't good enough, it's better to feel now than in the future where there are much worse consequences, where we couldn't go to college or whatever. Thank you so, very much. So it's really important for That'll me. That'll conclude your time. Uh, Uliana, uh, thank you. Uh, Raisa Karasik? Raisa? Um, Jacob's in the in the family. I invited the whole family up. Jamie. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Because um, I've got 18 Cleveland Street uh, as four addresses. So. No, no, no. So this is who was up there. I'm, I'm, I'm Jay's at the end. Jay's at the end. Jay Perlin. Okay. Yeah. Jay Perlin. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I am speaking today uh, on behalf of my brother, Benji. Mm -hmm. um, he's a bright and hardworking student uh, who recently faced an unfortunate and frankly unjust outcome regarding his application to the advanced math class. As you may be aware, Benji and multiple other students has demonstrated exceptional aptitude for mathematics well beyond their current grade level. His passion for the subject and his natural abilities make him a perfect student for the advanced program. In fact, Benji and I do lots of math outside of school with my parents and grandparents. Throughout, uh, we discuss problems from math Olympiads and work in college level subjects. Throughout all of this, he's consistently proven to be my level or even higher, while being two years younger. I'm currently in eighth grade in the advanced math per curriculum, and I'm doing well. For the years in this curriculum, I've uh, held my overall grade above a 95. Benji does this math with ease. He's, again, two years younger. I sometimes ask him for homework because it was helpful in my homework because of his critical thinking skills, and he can solve some of those problems better than I can. The main problem with this situation is that kids like my brother and uh, who have been working hard since an early age are being held back from educational opportunity later in life. Why did our administration fail these kids? Aren't we supposed to be looking up to the adults to do the right thing, to help us grow? All this has long-term consequences, including the effect on his self-esteem, which angers and hurts me. It hurts me to see him thinking that he's not good enough. 
I urge you to reconsider the criteria and the review process that led to Benji's and many other kids' failure of the test. It is essential that we provide all students with the opportunity to challenge themselves and, uh, and to grow and to reach a full potential. Benji has proven, proven time and time again that he's more than ready for the advanced program, and it would be a disservice to deny him the chance to continue his academic journey at a level that matches his abilities. In closing, I ask the school board to take a closer look at Benji's and many other students' cases and review the fairness of the testing and evaluation methods used. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Raisa Karasek? Is Raisa Karasek? Okay, hi. Sure. Come forward. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Raisa Karasek. I live at 50 Trowbridge Street in Arlington. I'm talking on behalf of my daughter, Ilana uh, Fanasiev. She is a sixth grader at Gibbs. She really likes math, but she doesn't like math in school because she finds it very boring. Uh, last year, she was very excited at the possibility of skipping math 6 and going to math 7, where she was hoping that she will finally see interesting problems in schools. And I would like to point out that she's actually one of the slower students. She doesn't like to shut out the answers. She's not quick, but if you give her time, she thinks about math problems very deeply and she solves them and actually shows up on her Excel scores in sixth grade. At the beginning of sixth grade, she scored 860, meaning she knows 60% of the eighth grade. And actually on one of her sub-scores, uh, which was specifically probability and statistics, she scored as a 12th grade level. I, nobody taught her that material. She never seen that material in school. It's just she's so curious when he gives her time, she solves hard problems, but she didn't pass the bypass math six class, although she got most of the problems correctly, most of her methods were classified as something that you do either in seventh grade or in high school. And whoever graded the test told us that that means that she's lacking some understanding, so she needs to stay back. And she's just bored and demotivated, and she consistently asks us, why does the school doesn't want to believe me that I'm good at math? That's how she takes the thing, the fact that she's not challenged. She asked us to help her, we ask her teachers to give her challenging problems in school, and it's just not happening because there is no space and time for that. Okay. So I asked the school to reconsider how they approach uh, this approach and to give interested kids a chance to try a hard math class and prove themselves. If they can do it, great. If they find challenges, like I ask an opportunity to go back to lower level if they find it challenging. I think it's good for kids to try harder classes, easier classes. I don't think we should box in kids and say, if you're 11th grade, you cannot get challenged. Thank you very much. Is there anybody on this list that I did not call? Yes. yes. Well, yeah, and I, I was supposed to go through. Okay, please come up and uh, sit, sit at the microphone and uh, identify yourself and your street address. Uliana Bashanova, 57 Wallace. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have three. I'm the wife of Dennis Grudkowski. I have three kids in APS in 10th, 6th, and 2nd grade. Uh, my 6th grader, Dimitri, was here at the last meeting. Hopefully you remember him speaking. He feels very passionate about math, but he does feel uh, unchallenged and uh, disengaged. We just met with his math teacher uh, yesterday. Uh, he's at the IXL level of 800, which is close to 8th grade now. And uh, I want to just emphasize two points. A lot has been already said. Um, First, it's, it's just clear that the current math um, approach to math education in our district um, to, to support the advanced learners is not working. And I feel like it um, actually goes kind of against the mission of IPS. I was just reviewing the mission of IPS, which talks about providing innovative learning opportunities to all students. And I think it's not supporting it. So not supporting advanced learners like our kids goes against also the strategic priority that APS has. And I saw it was saying that ensuring equity and excellence is one of those strategic priorities. I believe it's a number one priority for the APS district. The second point is urgency. Um, the year is still young, so we just passed the first quarter. Uh, every day that passes for these kids is a lost opportunity, really, for these kids to, um, to, 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 to develop their growth mindset. We talked about that. Um, and also, you know, they, they are going to, if we're not going to do anything this year, 
they're going to not just lose the meaningful learning, but they may lose their motivation, um, or they may, they may feel um, they lose confidence in their abilities as well. So we're not asking for anything really um, impossible. I know we, we provided the handout with immediate steps that can be taken now. So we're asking the committee to please consider that, and um, I hope we, together we're willing to work together, willing to step outside of our professional life, come to you and work together to create um, an equitable and uh, rigorous math curriculum for the students. <laughs> Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Anyone else on the list that I did not call or who had signed up? Seeing none, we will go on to introduce our AHS student representatives. There goes the train. Zach Fan and Asra Nurul Ahi. Um, you're smiling. Did I, how close did I get? <laughs> it's Asra Nurulahi. Nurulahi. Pretty close. Nurulahi. Nurulahi. Astra Nurulahi. Okay. So tell us about what's happening in the high school. So the last week of October, students took the PSAT test, and we got our results back this week. And this week we also had the parent-teacher conferences, one on Tuesday and one today. We were also able to pick our wellness workshops last weekend, uh, last week on Thursday during advisory, and students took the panorama survey and shared their thoughts on how the school year is going for them. Mm -hmm. um, as for athletics, a lot of teams made it to playoffs or divisions or states. So the boys and girls soccer team um, and the football team made it to playoffs. They're both out. Um, the boys and girls cross country team are going to states this states this weekend and. The swim, the girls' swim team, um, placed at a state tournament. Excellent. How's teaching and learning? What are you learning in school? Um, it's going pretty good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's the, the answer I gave my parents every night. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you learn in school? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I want to remind our student reps, you are full participants in this meeting. If you have something to say at any point, raise your hand. I will recognize you just like I'm recognizing anybody else at the table. All right, thank you. Um, next item will be the Cullinane, don I, I think it's the next item up, is the Cullinane donation. And I see Mr. Cullinane uh, in one of those little Zoom boxes over there. So um, I'll start with the superintendent who will do the introduction. Okay. Hello, Mr. Cullinane. I'm so glad you were able to join us tonight. Um, I was approached by Mr. Cullinane um, and members of his family about a parcel that they learned um, is actually ours. So the park that we were under the impression, we've checked this, by the way, about five times. Um, we were under the impression that the park that Millbrook runs through that is adjacent to the high school just outside our doors over here um, was under the care and custody of the town of Arlington. Um, we've since learned, because the Cullinanes asked about this, uh, that actually it is under the care and control of the school committee. And we did a lot of digging to double and triple check this. Uh, and the Cullinane family was interested in knowing, because the park has a meaning to them, which I'll let him explain, uh, whether or not the school district would be interested in cleaning up, maintaining said park uh, with funds that they are interested in donating to the school system. Um, aligned with that is a question about consideration of dedication of the space or naming of the space for the family. And so we have a separate process for that. And so I've sent Mr. Cullinane both of our policies, one linked to donations, um, one, and there's a, a message from him in your materials for tonight, one linked to how we name um, spaces here at the high school because we're currently undergoing that process. Uh, and they are understanding that those are two separate processes. They're not linked together. One does not preclude any decision-making uh, authority of the other committee. Um, but one of those policies, the donation policy in particular, requires the school committee to accept a donation, and then for us to figure out what our approach would be to accepting that donation from, uh, from a financial standpoint. So Mr. Cullinane is here to talk about um, what he came to me with originally and for you all to consider asking any questions. Mr. Cullinane, please proceed. Uh, you are muted right now. Um, How's that? There you go. There I go. Okay. Um, 
Just, just a little background. Uh, <clears throat> Could you identify your name and address for the record, please? Okay, my name is uh, John Cullinan, and I live in uh, 215 Country Club Road in Dedham, uh, Massachusetts, but I have uh, relatives, uh, numerous relatives who live in uh, Arlington by the name of Idson and uh, Vaughn. And uh, my family uh, uh, grew up on uh, Mill Street, and uh, my sisters went on in high school, as I did, and benefited greatly for, 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 uh, uh, from it. But the other uh, ironic thing is that uh, I got my whole idea for creating the first successful software parts company in the computer industry in a small two buildings right next to uh, the Jason Russell house. Okay, so to be that close to Mill Street where I grew up and then come up with an idea that would turn out to be so successful is really ironic. But what I want, what uh, I wanted to do along with my wife is make you know monies up to a hundred thousand dollars available uh, to. Uh, we uh, improved the uh, Mill Street, um, I mean, the Millbrook Park, which I spent my youth not only around the, the book, but in the book, and worked for companies on Mill Street like uh, uh, Zwickers and, uh, and famous places like that. So that's really why I'm, um, I would rather have been hit in person in, the, in your beautiful new uh, facilities in Allen High School, but my back was bothering. But I was very pleased to be able to come on and at least uh, address you briefly uh, on, on Zoom. And so that's basically, you know, why I'm here. And, and that's what, you know, we're interested in doing, if it could work out. And, and if uh, the, the park was turned into even more beautiful than it is and integrated with the uh, high school system in imaginative ways from an educational point of view, that would be certainly something my sisters and everybody in the family would like, including myself. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Uh, let me let me just state just for the uh, for the me uh, for the meeting is that the law and school committee policy requires us to take a an affirmative vote to accept a gift of any value to the district, um, and uh, there are whatever legal issues that might arise from accepting a gift. Uh, we, we've uh, discussed this with uh, town council and I think that we're clear on that. Mm -hmm. But we've put this on the agenda for first read so that the committee and the community are aware this is before us and we can schedule a vote at the next meeting if it's also the wish of the committee to um, explore the details in probably community relations subcommittee. That could be a request from the, the um, members of the committee. But that's where we are right now. We're at a first read. We're listening. We're asking questions. And we'll put this on for an action item, assuming that there there's no reason for delay at our next meeting. So any questions from the committee? Ms. Morgan. So just to clarify, we own this land as it turns yes, out. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. As it turns out. Good to know. Um, and we're aware of the implications around the Conservation Commission because yes. they have a, an inordinate amount of say as to what can be done with any of that property because my understanding is it fully runs right through sure their jurisdiction. Is it is it all contained within their I'm jurisdiction? I'm not sure if it's all contained. One of the first things we would need to do were we to accept the donation is figure out what sorts of studies would need to be done for us to do whatever kind of work we would imagine doing. Um, it, first of which I imagine might be to clean up aspects of the brook itself and the area surrounding it, uh, which it could use. There's debris in the brook and there's some fallen trees, and so we would need to talk to the Conservation Commission about any of that work. That but it's not, a, I mean, the, we, we, we have this land, apparently, mm -hmm. right? So we're only talking about the hundred, the, the, the monetary donation that would be available. Available to, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, all right, thank you. But I, I mean, I guess in accepting that, we are taking on responsibility yes, to yes. steward that donation appropriately, yes. mm -hmm. right? Under, you know, in a, a, a very tricky plot of property. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is interest, and I haven't followed up with Dr. Janger on this uh, much deeper than this, but from a student group that studies environmental conservation um, to be involved in some of that, which would be an awesome opportunity for them to get um, 
a sense of what the Conservation Commission does and what some of the governance uh, pieces are that are entailed in doing a project like that, and for them to plan it and have the ability to do some of the planning around the funds, which would be a great learning opportunity for them. Yeah, which is great. Well, and we, I mean, now that we know that we own it, we have a certain inherent responsibility yes. for that mm -hmm. piece of property anyway. Right. So it's wonderful that you're here, uh, Mr. Kulinane, because we're going <laughs> to, I think we're going to, we're going to need your help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, very nice of Mr. Cullinane to make this gift. I um, just, just the Conservation Commission, you don't really go to them until you actually have a plan. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's, you, you know, once we have all the plans and they're all vetted by, you know, whoever has to vet them, then you go to the commission and then stuff happens. <clears throat> the process begins. So um, we could. We could suspend the rules and vote tonight, or we can wait till a second reading. I, I don't. It's a, I think it's fair for the community to okay. go to a second reading. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Any other questions, comments from the committee? I just want to say very generous of you, sir. So thank you so much for being so thoughtful and generous. My yeah. pleasure. I think we're all very impressed in, with your generosity and thankful that you're here before us. Uh, it's just a matter of this is something we don't normally handle and uh, th this is uh, a new topic to us and we generally go and and uh, let it uh, marinate for a couple of weeks before we make a firm decision. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, so I wanted to join everyone in thanking you for your generous donation. Uh, my one question is you understand that we don't know if we'll what this what will happen with any naming rights. Um, so well, that's that's clearly uh, that's clearly understood. No, okay. David. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. There's no, there's no. Uh, uh, it's just this. We, we, it's, it's just kind of complicated because it started with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, parks and recreation. We thought that was that's who owned it, but it turned out the school committee owns it. <laughs> so, and, you know, and I, I, I I'm very experienced, so I I know these things don't happen easily, and there's lots of people involved and. And I'm willing to work with the process and see if it, we can end up doing something. And <coughs> that's good for the school and the town. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. As you can see, town government is multifaceted. Any other yeah. questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, Mr. Colony, thank you so very much. We're very grateful to you, and we look forward <coughs> to seeing you in, in, I think it's three weeks. Thank you. Next. 7.15 p.m., uh, we're even running early. Uh, former uh, future school committee meetings. I mean, a couple of years ago, we did a meeting in Mecca. I think that it was very well done, and I just wanted to put that before us to see if we could agree on a date for doing that. So if there, uh, please communicate with uh, our administrative secretary, Ms. Diggins, if there are any dates in the calendar between now and April that would be either advantageous for you or problematic for you as we try to consult with MECO to see if that would happen because I don't want this to be a hardship. I want this to be a joy. This would be a regular meeting. Regular Your regular meeting, regular meeting. Regular, uh, yeah. as we did two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. we held a regular meeting over at MECO. Um, next, bracket school improvement plan. Superintendent. Hi. <laughs> okay. While they come up, um, I will be driving slides for you all. All right. And I'm very excited to have Dr. Weiss here, and I will let you introduce Mr. Vanderlane. I almost said Amaral. I like <laughs> caught myself. Um, and. Uh, I know that they're going to share some of the really exciting work happening at Bracket this year, um, and I just want to thank the team for being here for all of the work that you are putting into collaboration at Bracket. They ho are also hosting residencies this week with our DEIBJ department and did their debrief today, and so uh, there's a lot going on over Bracket <coughs> Elementary School, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Just let me know with a nod or a slide if you want me to switch it. Great. Well, we can actually advance to the next one already. Um, so, hello again. I'm Dr. Gretchen Weiss, and with me is Mr. Michael Vanderlane. We are excited to hear to talk to you about year two for us. 
Um, and I also have some other people who I'd like to introduce who are here with us. Um, our instructional leadership team, Michelle Crowley, our math coach, Lorraine Keir, the literacy coach, Megan Murray, music teacher, Callie Thompson, third grade, Danielle Varallo, fourth grade, and Octavia Bronner, the director of math and computer science. Mm -hmm. um, they are all here um, to support us, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, before we start, you may have heard that we're doing a bit of construction um, in, the, <laughs> in the bracket area up on the, the top of the hill with the playgrounds. And I just wanted to say that I have been incredibly impressed with the collaboration between our school facilities department, the contractor, and the designers. They have kept students and families at the forefront of their decision making throughout the process. And I wanted to thank you for that investment in the back bracket community. And uh, speaking of our wonderful bracket community, um, we'd like to share a little bit more about our uh, school and the community that we all serve. Um, so as I look here on my graph, there we go. <clears throat> Uh, the first graph here shows uh, that our, our, the enrollment in each grade level as opposed to last year. And last year we graduated 98 fifth graders, uh, which brings our current enrollment to approximately 400 students, which we're finding is a really good size for the physical space of our building as we're looking at our learning spaces throughout our school community. Uh, we've also included on the slide data about the racial diversity of our community and the changes we're seeing in our younger grades. Now for some bracket glows a little bit beyond the numbers here. Uh, our teachers have been working hard on the implementation of the new EL curriculum, and we are incredibly proud of all of our staff as we enter year two of this implementation plan. Uh, grades two and three are on their second year, uh, with all the other grades finishing the, module of, uh, the first module of their first year. And informally, we're seeing that we have much stronger writers in our second and fourth grade groups of students. These, this cohort <coughs> had already completed EL last year uh, as part of the rollout. And uh, pictured here are some examples that we have of our student work from this curriculum. We have our first grade students recess box, part of their Magnificent Thing uh, project, where students identify a problem in our school community and they invent a solution and they write about it. We also have our third grade frog trading cards uh, that they use as their writing project. And we have our second grade writing about schools and comparing and contrasting the ways that students have access to learning all around the world. And as you can see in the graph, early data on MCAS is favorable, and we're seeing an upswing in percentage of our third grade students who are meeting and exceeding. Diving deeper into the data, we saw an increase in essay and writing sections, and also vocabulary usage improved. And we've been engaging our families and caregivers into the school as volunteers and leaders and experts in content. Our parents and family members uh, came into the school and volunteered in the library, in classrooms, uh, as mystery readers or chaperones on field trips, and during events such as Hour of Code, uh, Field Day, and Literacy Week. Having such a strong family and caregiver presence really is a joy for our school community, and it strengthens our homeschool relationships. And as we can see in the responses from our uh, Panorama survey, we have significant, we improved significantly um, as the response to student needs too. We've also focused on bringing teachers into the leadership of our school uh, and empowering them through decision making uh, to increase the opportunity for faculty voice. First through the committee structure which we piloted last year and this year's committees at our school include community expectations, all school assemblies, sunshine, technology, and a committee that is doing a book study on the text Differentiation and the Brain by Thomason and Souza. And pictured here, we can see the work of our fabulous ILT members who are here tonight, engaging in a root cause analysis to examine the ways all of our instructional core is manifested with our student learning and ways that we can look at that. Um, we are also uh, mentoring both an aspiring principal fellow and an emerging teacher leader in conjunction with the CLE program. And through our intentional engagement of our faculty, our panorama indicates our staff belonging is growing to about 97%. As you can tell from our glows, we look at many data points to see our successes. MCAS is definitely not the only indicator of academic success, and you will see in our action steps, we are using a variety of data collection <clears throat> methods in order to track our progress on our goals. However, the percentage of students who are meeting and exceeding on both our ELA and math MCAS data has been similar over the past few years. And so looking at the root causes of this, provides us with insight about what our priorities and our action steps should be. 
when specifically looking at groups of students, we notice other continuing trends. The first graph shows a gap from our high needs students and our non high needs students for ELA. As you can see, this is lessening and we are encouraged by this. When looking at the district focal groups that comprise the high needs category, we, re we remain focused on our students with IEPs. As seen in the second graph, this achievement gap persists. When thinking about the data, it's always important to triangulate and dig deeper. Last year, our instructional leadership team, alongside our school council, conducted empathy interviews to go beyond the numbers and talk directly with the families that this data represents. They provided insights that shaped our action steps and future areas of inquiry. Based on this and other data, we came up with four strategic goals that are outlined in our school improvement plan. By reading the full plan, you will see how we are approaching these priorities and places where we are intentionally trying to increase coherence by reiterating action steps. We are highlighting, though, three key initiatives for you tonight. The first key initiative is our focus on increasing student academic discourse across all curricular areas. Academic discourse is a way for students to express their ideas, respond to their peers, and engage in dialogue. It is a vital skill that helps students develop critical thinking and communication skills and understand the subject matter more deeply. We set this as a school-wide goal and as such are centering our professional learning on academic discourse during building and team meetings. We are using our resources from the district, such as district instructional rounds and the partnership with EL Education to gather data and reflect on practice in real time. Academic discourse is a key component of the EL curriculum where it is supported with protocols and total participation techniques. We are also intentionally fostering discourse in math instruction as seen here, where teachers are learning about building thinking classrooms in a team meeting. To directly impact the achievement gap, we as a school are building more inclusive environments for our students. Our learning specialists are partnering with a general education teacher to teach the module lessons for the EL curriculum, in addition to supporting small groups during the skills block. Reading and math interventionists are working within the classroom. This allows them to seamlessly integrate their tier two and three instruction into the classroom lessons. This allows students to be directly supported in the application of the discrete skills. Inclusion is not just for academic times. In response to the empathy interviews, we are working with the PTO to rethink community events so that all families can enjoy and participate fully. And we are in year two of building school-wide expectations. Our previous work sought the input of our stakeholder and our focal groups to identify the values of our community. And if you didn't know, the bracket mascot is the cricket and crickets chirp. So <laughs> uh -huh. chirp is an anagram uh, that makes up these co-created core values. And our core values that we came up with and uh, were revealed and discovered through this process are courage, honesty, inclusion, and responsibility so we can be proud to be bracket crickets. And this work supports the practical context of our school-wide expectations while honoring the individual needs and contributions of our school community members. School-wide expectations like CHIRP that are comprehensive and developed within the school community sustain students' engagement in their learning because it allows students to focus on their learning instead of trying to decipher all the expectations placed upon them throughout the many spaces they navigate at school. And in leaning into the inclusive part of CHIRP, We've been excited to partner with our district's diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, belonging, and justice department as they conducted a week-long residency to guide action steps over the next two to three years. Uh, last year, you asked me what resources I needed, and we talked about supporting our paraprofessionals and custodial staff. These pictures are from what our second grade students explored as their platforms for them being president, um, they are interested in longer lunches, more choice time, better bathrooms, and a hot tub. <laughs> so, but one thing I did want to mention is the impact that the increase of after school resources is having on physical spaces in our buildings. We have worked alongside facilities to upgrade and care for our building. 
However, with more space occupied later in the evening, our custodial staff has less time to clean and prepare for the early morning arrival. And I know this is hard on them. And with that, we are so incredibly proud to lead the amazing team of educators and learners at Brackett Elementary. Thank you so much for your continued support. You look, it looks like a conclusion. Uh, <laughs> so I will now go to the committee for any questions or comments. <clears throat> Ms. Morgan. Um, can you, Dr. Homan, can you go back to the bracket grow slide on the ELA groups? Yeah, keep going. Oh, one forward. I mean, yeah, that one. So, Dr. Weiss, I, I just, I want to... So when you talked about this, the high need students versus the non high need students, right? And you said, oh, but the gap is closing, right? But like, that's not the, we don't want our gap to close like this, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we yes. want our gap, we want to keep our, our non high need students, we want them to be going up and we want our high need students to be going up more-ish, right? Yes. Like that's, like we don't actually want our gaps to close by our, our non, our like, not group to actually be decreasing, right? Obviously. So I guess that's, I, I just like, I want to make sure that that's like how we're talking about things all the time everywhere, right? Because that, because this, it, I mean, it, it could have gone down more, I suppose, right? But this, I, it's it, like, Yes, and I think that the, the, the high need students are also, as a group, have improved. So I think that they're, when I think about that is the swing that I see as far Which as is great. the encouraging part. Yes, yes. But, but clearly not the students with IEPs who make up that high needs group, mm -hmm. right? So in fact, like the students with, I mean, the IEP trend is not good. No. Right? Let's just, I mean, it's, it's like that, that's. And I yeah. think that, and, and I didn't want to hide that. Sure. Right? No, and no, I'm not implying that you yes. were, but it, it's it, right. So, but, but if, if, you know, if high needs is, is ticking up, which is good, right? Agreed. Like mm -hmm. that, that's what we want to see because that could, that could be on the way, right? But we, these, we got to bring these kids with us. Yes. And, and that's really where that became a, mm -hmm. a huge priority for within the SIP. And so the changes <clears throat> directly to more inclusive environments, being co-teaching and in more inclusion in other in other ways, as well as um, are, are some of the action steps that we're taking towards that, but also the pieces of academic discourse which should in, which should impact all students. Right. Great. Thank you, Mr. Harden. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and I like how, how you split it up. It was very nice that you uh, both participated mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. equally. Um, so. Uh, you're two years in as a new school leadership team. Um, thank you for showing, you know, honestly your results. You, you highlighted some things that you want to do. Were there things that you've tried that obviously aren't working that you're not <coughs> continuing, or how are you how are you shifting focus to these new initiatives? Are there things you're de are there things you're de-emphasizing? Right. Um, I think. So last year was really a, a lot about learning, right? And I think that some of the things where we did see some, um, some small improvements were the things that we were trying on a larger scale this year. Specifically, um, if you get down into the data, as far as like math, um, we did see a, um, a decrease in the gap in like fourth grade math. And in fourth grade math, the teachers were working really specifically on academic discourse and bringing more vocabulary instruction into those math classes. And that's actually where we started to see our, um, our non-IEP students staying high and our IEP students growing. And so we've used sort of small changes to see what is starting to work and then think about how we can do those on larger scales. Um, as far as things that we've tried that are not working, um, not changing things is, is didn't, didn't work, right? And I think that like, you know, so I think that we're going to need to think really um, systematically and, and try things out quickly 
because for me, this is a really um, central piece to what we need to do as a school. Great, thank you. Uh, Superintendent? I just wanted to add to this just from my vantage point, it's a little, uh, a little different. I think in their first year also, I saw a lot of specific focus on development of and, and very careful implementation of structures around school attendance, um, uh, on-time arrival, uh, office procedures, um, and these are like little technical things, but that make a huge impact on the sort of day-to-day -day running of the school. Um, and also heard a reflection from folks who were there this week visiting Brackett that there is a huge emphasis on these two being out in classrooms mm -hmm. um, with students, engaging with the folks who are doing the work, understanding the EL curriculum, and being involved in the day-to-day -day instruction. And I, I think that that shift is one I've noticed, like from a sort of focus on operations and making sure that those are shored up and very and the expectations are very clear. Uh, there were back there were safety backpacks that go with every class <laughs> were introduced last year, like little things mm -hmm. um, into a really deep focus on instruction that's been really exciting to see. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey followed by Mr. Fieldman. Thank you. Could you um, move back to slide six? It's a bracket close. It has the ILT leadership. So my fellow members have already asked the hard questions and I appreciate them doing that. But I just wanted to point out that belonging at 97% is just amazing. And I wonder if you could speak at all about what you've been doing to get that. I don't think we've ever seen anything that high. Um. The, the bracket faculty and staff is an incredible group of professionals. And I think that um, there was an opportunity for uplifting the amazing, their amazing um, skills and strengths and really listening to them. And so I can say that that our teachers are really the ones that are going to change our schools, right? We as administrators are there to support them and to um, help them get through when things are operationally not working and to guide them instruction, um, with leadership, but they are really um, doing the hard work of this. And I think that the more that you uplift teachers, the more feeling they have of being a community together that can work together um, and so that is what I've tried to do. Um, it's, it's really a testament to the way that they include each other as well and the way that they support each other that, that gives us those numbers. Thank you. Mr. Fielman. Dr. Allison Ampey uh, picked up on one point I was going to make, so thank you. Um, the second point, I, was, uh, I had a question was the, um, you know, as I'm looking at these scores, I, I'm just wondering if, if you have an overall refl or a reflection on any impact the pandemic has had on these kids now that they're in third, fourth, and fifth grade, and did they, <clears throat> I mean, is that is that being reflected at all here? Is there, even if it's anecdotal, do you have any sense? Um, I think that in general, so our, our, our fifth grade group, right, right. was, um, was impacted in that they, that was their first grade year, yeah. and then second grade was, was tricky for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yes, in these scores we do see some of that, but I think that um, really thinking <laughs> beyond that, that data point as to what we're doing instructionally to, to, um, to make sure that we're meeting all of our students' needs is, where I like to focus, um, so yes, maybe, yeah. but, I mean, but the test goes I'm, I'm kind of like, yeah, I know and, it's, it's a very, it's, and a, it's, here we it's go. A, not a question you can answer with necessarily with data. You have to think, we'd all have to think about it some more. I just, like, I was going to tie the, the, you have a very engaged faculty, obviously. I mean, did they say, did they talk about like, you know, what, what they're experiencing in the classroom with these fifth graders compared to fifth graders about I had four years ago, I guess. <clears throat> Or third grade, or fourth grade, doesn't matter. Um, 
Yes and yes and no. Yeah. I think you know one of the conversations we had today in the instructional leadership team was about how hard the kids are working right now, oh, sure. and 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 that's awesome, right? Yeah. We want our kids to be doing the hard work. We want them to own their own learning, and so I think that that that's a really important piece um, to sort of highlight in this is you know our, our teachers are working really hard and our students are working really hard, and. Um, and because of that, I think that um, that we we have um, such amazing potential as a school. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Any other members of the community uh, committee? I have one question, uh, which just sort of came out of the uh, ELA scores. Um, it's always a challenge to maintain good scores when you're changing curriculum. I know we've shifted curriculum in ELA. Uh, how's that going? Uh, is are you getting more comfortable with it? Is it flowing better? Uh, are we more practiced in it and uh, um, expecting a take? Every day we get better. Uh -huh. We have an amazing support mm -hmm. system and our literacy coach, um, mm -hmm. and our math coach also is is really incredibly supportive mm -hmm. of of the curriculum as far as um, aspects of it as well. I think that. Um, Yes, every day it gets mm. easier, and every day you are learning something mm. new, and that's a really hard place to be as a teacher, mm -hmm. where you're trying to to um, do the best for your students every single day. Um, I think we've seen from our teachers who are teaching in year two, mm -hmm. they are um, feeling like they're getting mm -hmm. the hang of it, of course, more. Um, and you know, we did see some you know, sort of preliminary pieces of, of some impact on scores um, because of the new curriculum, mm -hmm. which was really encouraging to see that our third grade teachers were the ones who taught the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Our third grade scores were the ones that went up most in ELA. Yeah, it's sort of interesting because I have an expectation that whenever you're implementing a new curriculum, you're going to see a temporary dip in, in, in scores. And looking across the district, uh, uh, the, the scores have held more or less steady, um, some little dips here and there, but uh, it definitely does not point to the fact that we've overhauled our curriculum so that uh, apparently the teachers are doing great work in terms of uh, making the adjustment and doing well with uh, they, what we're doing. They are, <laughs> absolutely. Any other co uh, comments or questions? Ah, um, so I just have a quick comment about your slogan. Um, this probably like hasn't really inf infiltrated the elementary school yet, but in the high school, like chirp, when you say chirp, it like refers to like insulting someone or talking. <laughs> <about them. laughs> so, yes. uh, I think especially on sports teams yeah, is what yeah. we've heard. Yes. <laughs> yep. We're gonna take it back. I think okay. we'll, we'll go for the positivity. Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Been reclaimed. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know you had the new mascot over there. I mean, I'm used to dealing it's, with flamingos and so pineapples. Around. Yeah, it's it's um, Hoppington the cricket. Um, and Is it Hoppington yeah. the cricket? Yeah, apparently it's been around for a while. Oh, we just yeah, haven't yeah, really. Yeah. The cricket's it's been around for a while, but the fifth graders, don't they pick different names? The fifth yes. grade, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I'm used to uh, pineapples and flamingos <laughs> and bishop bears, and uh, yeah. uh, but I haven't heard crickets before. Yeah. No, it's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you live up in the bracket yeah, community. I, know so you know. I guess if there are crickets around, uh, they're up there. The turkeys are over on uh, Henderson Street or something. I don't know. They're a bunch of oh, turkeys. No, they're everywhere, Paul. Yeah, they're all over. <laughs> they, I saw one flying over um, Medford Street the other day. In any case, thank you for your comment. Uh, we learned from you. Any other uh, questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, thank you, Bracket School. So we move on to the Stratton School. Thank you. Thank you for coming, ILT. Good to see you. We have a big crowd here. Hold on one second. And I'll leave it to the superintendent to introduce you when she's ready. All right. Let me get slides up. So this doesn't look like a cricket. It looks Are like a lion. Are all of you talking? 
just briefly. Okay. Make sure you pass the Make microphone sure yes. because I know they're they're the folks uh, uh, the, the, for the people at home and for the uh, ACMI and the rest of the world. Okay. So. Nothing about this surprises me of the Stratton team. Um, <laughs> because this is a place where you go and you always find people working together and helping one another out. Um, Stratton is our second largest school. Mm -hmm. It is now our most diverse school in terms of learning needs, um, and racial ethnic diversity, and it is a really exciting place to be every single day because you always walk in and see teachers loving and really caring deeply about the growth and learning of their students. And I am really excited to hand it over to Principal Kelly and the rest of the crew who I'll let you introduce. And you'll tell me when to switch slides. Yes, okay. thank you. So uh, thank you all for having us here tonight. Uh, it is practically past our bedtime here. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate this incredible team being here uh, with us. And uh, I, I wanna just thank you all we, I have worked in other school districts and we truly feel the support of the school committee at Stratton regularly. And um, that really should be stated. So we appreciate your support. Um, so I'm honored to speak on behalf of Stratton and much, that, much of what we'll share tonight um, is the result of work done by many members of the Stratton community beyond those that are here this evening. Uh, there have actually only been five full months of school since we were last year talking about our school improvement plan. So you will uh, see lots of consistencies from, our, from last year's plan to this plan. Oh, good, you switched, thank you. So I'm here tonight with uh, Assistant Principal Dr. O'Brien and members of our ILT who will introduce themselves momentarily. We're also grateful to have Dr. Hoyo as a member of our ILT uh, and feel very supported by Dr. Hoyo. Uh, we're gonna start with some celebrations. Oh, I was just gonna go over the agenda, but we're, we're gonna start with some celebrations uh, of our efforts at Stratton and each of these wonderful folks will talk a little bit about some of the things that we have to celebrate. And then we'll show a small slice of the data that we looked at to inform, or that we, we look at regularly to inform our improvement planning. Our, we'll talk about some priority goals and the actions that we're taking to meet those goals. And finally, we'll open it up for your questions. So I'm gonna turn it over in a moment to Jillian, uh, who's a third grade teacher at Stratton. And Jillian's actually come full circle because she attended Stratton as a student. She's gonna speak about one of our really exciting initiatives, which uh, is Playworks. We were so fortunate in the spring to receive an AEF grant to fund our collaboration with Playworks. Playworks is a national organization dedicated to enhancing children's health and well-being by promoting safe and meaningful play in schools. Playworks offers various services, including on-site coaching, professional development for educators, which we all experienced and enjoyed a lot, uh, consultative support, all aimed at improving recess and uh, our playtime experiences in general, including indoor recess. By implementing structured play and conflict resolution strategies, Playworks helps reduce bullying, increase physical activity for our students and our staff members, and enhance students' readiness to learn. So, Jillian. I apologize, I feel like my back's to you. Um, part of our work with Playworks includes providing students with a toolbox of different activities and games that can be played at recess, inside, outside, or when there's any sort of free moment in time. Learning these games provides increased opportunities 
for inclusion so that all students can participate and eliminate some social barriers while increasing opportunities for play. These activities also allow students to participate, to pr I mean, sorry, allow students to practice social emotional skills such as patience, regulation, empathy, and compassion while having fun with peers. It also provides many opportunities for leadership from students and a growing sense of community since all students are learning the games. Hi, I'm Stuart Deck. I'm a paraprofessional at Stratton. I'm part of the math intervention team. Each grade level has a different 30 minute block of time called the WIN block, an acronym for what I need. These 30 minute blocks are set aside for leveled and grouped math work this year, exclusively for math work. During these win blocks, general education teachers are able to meet with small groups for focused math work and interventionists are able to push into classrooms for small group instruction and practice. Students are also able to engage with each other during these win blocks in curriculum-based math games and activities to get extra practice with concepts. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Sullivan. I'm a behavior analyst at Stratton and also an Arlington resident, almost a decade now. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys about the SLCA. It's one of um, the largest, if not possibly, um, the largest um, special ed program in the district. It services students um, that have autism. And right now we're, we just hit over 30 students, so quite a large group, uh, K through five. And you know, over the years from what I've been told, this is only my fourth year, in the district, uh, 13th year in special ed, that this is like like the um, the demographic of the students have changed, like the needs are more varied. Some of our students are nearly full inclusion. We have other friends that have very um, modified curriculum. Some of our friends are AAC users, others are vocal communicators. Um, some have more um, behavioral support needs, others uh, more academic. So kind of with that in mind, um, you know, the, the needs of the students are really varied and significant, which requires a lot on the, the um, kind of on behalf of the staff that are working with them. As of this year, we added an additional SLC teacher. Thank you folks for, who voted for that. Um, and in addition to, you know, slowly adding different supports to help make this a more sustainable program because we are seeing more and more need coming into the program. Um, we are working with a consultant through Walker School, um, and they're helping us kind of figure out what everybody's priorities are, and then based off of the priorities and needs, coming up with action plans instead of you know simply talking about it. We like to do things. We're we're a very active group, and so to be able to work with them and come up with our action plan so that we can truly support our students, our staff, and our students' families, because we want to make sure that our program is the kind of program that anybody here would be happy to have their child in. And that's what we're aiming for. So, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lauren. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Stratton. And I'm excited to talk about the faculty committees that we have um, started up this year. The committees at Stratton provide faculty and staff with the opportunity to address and advocate for school-wide matters that they have particular interest in. We had a lot of say in what those committees looked like. These committees range from planning effective all school meetings, which we call pride meetings, to organizing learning walks um, and shared practices among educators, which is especially useful with our new EL curriculum. Committees meet on a monthly basis and provide time for connections across grade levels and varying subject areas, which also in turn helps with um, our goal of fostering that sense of belonging. And I think that also um, is a reflection of our student <coughs> sense of belonging as well. And they can see the faculty doing that as well. Hi, um, I'm Kim Pratt. I am a long time, long time Stratton <laughs> teacher. Um, I'm talking about um, the EL implementation, which is not new to anybody. Um, but I think what I would like uh, the school committee and the superintendent, I think she knows, how um, Stratton has gone all in for, no offense, correct. 
but <laughs> <laughs> if you know Stratton, when we take something on, we take it on 1,000%. So when this started a couple years ago and started talking about the new curriculum, um, we were, I hope, the first, I think we were the first to jump in and say, hey, we're ready. We'll take anything on. We'll pilot it. We'll do it. What do you want us to do? Um, Lucy. Buffer cycles. <laughs> and, went, and we were ready to go. Um, for us, we had first and fifth grade be the first cohort that went through to implement. We put in a lot of <clears throat> blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> to get it up and running. And we loved it, I can say, as a first grade teacher. And so we're happy that grades K, 2, 3, and 4 have now jumped on board. And it's been great for now as the whole staff to have the common language, to talk about this, and to just feed off each other's like enthusiasm for this um, curriculum. So don't need to talk about it more. <laughs> Hi, my name is Megan Kolodny. I am a second grade teacher at Stratton and I'm here to talk about the student supports and intervention. Like Stuart was setting at Stratton School, every single day we have our what I need block. We have a math block and we also have a ELA win block as well. During these times, students are being pulled into small groups and having catered instructions either by their general education teacher, by the special education teacher if needed in their IEP, and also our math interventionists and reading interventionists. All of these services are happening within the general ed classroom. I think it's really great as a general ed teacher because I get to see my interventionist colleagues a lot more. And I also have an opportunity to quickly talk with them and be like, hey, how did this student do? Oh, they need X, Y, and Z. Great, tomorrow during my full group lesson, I'll make sure that I do X, Y, and Z to target their needs. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abigail Gooding. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Stratton. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about our new policy of co-teaching morning meeting, which has been an exciting opportunity in a way that we've worked together as a school to build belonging among our staff, but also among our students. Um, morning meeting is such an important part of the day to build a sense of community among the students, but it's also a really great moment where students can get to know other teachers and where teachers around the school who maybe don't aren't general ed teachers can get to know students that they wouldn't normally work with. And so this year I'm partnering with one of our reading interventionist teachers and we're co-teaching our classroom together and students who she wouldn't normally work with get to say hi to her and have a relationship with a teacher outside of our classroom um, that they get to really bond with, which has been really exciting and has just fostered a better sense of belonging at our school. Okay, so we're, is this working? Oh, okay. Uh, we are going to jump into some data. So here's just some basic uh, data that highlights Stratton's racial demographics. Liz spoke to our increasing diversity, uh, and you'll hear about our, many of our uh, priority actions aimed at celebrating Stratton's rich diversity. We currently have 449 students at Stratton with four sections at most grade levels. On this slide, I'd like to draw your attention to a few areas. As you can see, we have many multilingual learners at Stratton. Of our 52 students receiving English language instruction, 17 are level one, which means that they're at the very beginning stages of English acquisition. We currently have 108 students receiving services or accommodations through an IEP or a 504. Our high needs percentage, as you can see, is nearly 30%. And the high needs, I think, um, uh, Brackett spoke about high needs focal group, but our high needs focal group is an unduplicated count of all students belonging to at least one of the following groups, students with disabilities, multilingual learners, or former multilingual learners, um, and or low income students. Although we look at these focal groups individually, tonight we're really focusing on our 
um, high needs group as a whole. Like the other schools who have spoken before us, we have uh, two academic strategic goals, a culture and climate goal, and a family engagement goal aligned to our five-year strategic plan. Okay, so our first priority goal is to address, address the achievement gap in literacy between students identified as high needs and non-high needs. You can see in this chart a persistent gap over time between the percentage of third, fourth, and fifth grade students identified as high needs and the students identified as non-high needs meeting or exceeding expectations on MCAS. And that gap, unfortunately, has been long-standing and stayed the same. Next slide. So this slide shows some of our growth data, or well, I wish it showed uh, more growth data, but uh, on the left we see that the students in our high needs focal group, the teal, that teal line, uh, have a lower percentage, uh, growth percentile, than our non-high needs students. And the student growth percentile, as I'm I'm sure you know, measures student scores compared to their academic peers, cohorts. Um, and then when we isolated students on IEPs, we can see this persistent growth gap as well. And in order, you know, in order to close these gaps, we need to see acceler accelerated growth for our students on IEPs and our high needs students. So what are we doing about it? You heard some of this from my fabulous colleagues. Um, we are all about supporting at the implementation of our EL curriculum, and we are already seeing incredible things. The second grade teachers talk all the time about the um, writing of the students come because they piloted in first grade uh, what they're seeing already a couple of months into school uh, in terms of the writing of their second graders compared to previous years. Um, we are really focused, as you heard, on co-teaching at Stratton, primarily during the skills block and our all blocks instead of pulling students out of their classrooms for tier two and three interventions, we're supporting this collaboration and data-based co-planning between classroom teachers and support teachers. And so instead of interventions happening in hallways and corner offices, when you walk into classrooms at Stratton now, Megan talked about, you see um, teachers and support staff working with students and students working with one another. The benefits of this approach are numerous, uh, but three really important ones are teachers learning from one another and improving their own practice, the interventions being more closely aligned with the curriculum, and students receiving additional supports without having to leave the belonging of their classroom environments. Next slide. Our second academic goal is also related to literacy, but it goes a little bit wider to um, improving classroom instruction and rigor by using high leverage practices to increase student engagement and also students' academic mindsets. Of the 123 students surveyed in the third through <coughs> fifth grade panorama survey, only 59% reported favorably that their teachers had extremely high expectations for them, and we know we can do better than that. In a recent 
EL Learning Walk a few weeks ago, we saw significant evidence of teachers providing supports, encouragement, and opportunities equally well for students in, in classrooms across all subgroups in four of the nine classrooms that we visited. In our next learning walk, we want to see significant evidence of this indicator in nine out of nine classrooms that we visit. We're incredibly excited about the work that we're doing with our coach from EL Education. The data that we get from these learning walks is directly informing our professional development. So one way to provide that support that was is mentioned in that indicator to students is through specific and targeted feedback. And we identified this as an area for improvement in our previous learning walk. So on December 11th, Erica, our EL coach, our EL education coach, Shannon, our building ELA coach, and I will be co-facilitating professional development for our faculty on how to give effective feedback to students. Now, before I completely lose my voice, <laughs> Dr. O'Brien's going to talk about um, our third goal. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, everyone. Our third strategic goal is centered on improving our students' sense of belonging at Stratton. This means that ensuring every student feels understood, supported by adults, respected by their peers, and part of our school community. So according to our Panorama Spring 2024 student survey data, of the 123 student respondents, only 53% of them reported feeling a strong sense of belonging at school. When we dug deeper into that data point, we found that students showing respect for one another was the lowest reported component of belonging at 48%. This finding emphasized for us the need to focus on building connections, particularly for our LGBTQ plus students multilingual learners and students receiving IEP or 504 services and has served as a driver for the following action steps. To address these challenges, we're implementing several initiatives. School-wide expectations. We are engaging faculty, staff, students, and families to establish and consistently reinforce positive school-wide expectations. This initiative is tied to the EL curriculum's habits of character and builds on responsive classroom and second step practices to foster inclusivity and respect. You heard Amy and Jillian both describe PlayWorks. By utilizing the PlayWorks model, we are fostering inclusive and engaging play at recess, providing <coughs> opportunities for all students to connect and develop those positive relationships. To support our students in the SLC, we are working on stabilizing and strengthening this program through targeted professional development, enhanced collaboration between special and general educators, and meaningful family engagement. We are also piloting an integrated bullying prevention in inter intervention model using a new health curriculum alongside the second step program to create a safer more respectful <coughs> school climate we are promoting cultural diversity and fostering belonging by displaying artwork representing various cultures and incorporating multilingual signage around the school we're also implementing swiss it's a school-wide information system to track behavior data which allows us to tailor social emotional learning interventions and address behavior proactively providing targeted tier two and tier three supports as you heard, our faculty committees are actively engaged in supporting school morale, school-wide expectations, assemblies, DEIBJ efforts, and other school events to promote teacher leadership and empowerment. Morning meetings are co-led by classroom teachers and additional staff members, creating stronger connections and fostering a sense of belonging for all students and our faculty. Our fourth goal is to strengthen family engagement and improve the sense of belonging for our diverse uh, school community. Data from our family survey indicates that only 57% of families reported feeling that the school values their child's background. This provides us with an opportunity to improve communication and foster authentic connections with our families. Our initiatives to strengthen family engagement include celebrating our diversity. We have established a DEIBJ faculty committee to create opportunities for students to share and celebrate their cultural heritage fostering pride and a sense of community among all of our students. In collaboration with our PTO, we are creating in-person opportunities for families to connect and engage with one another, ensuring all voices are heard and represented. 
We're building a database of caregiver expertise and interest to align with curriculum topics, including caregivers to contribute their knowledge and experiences in meaningful ways. An example of this is a few weeks from now, second grade caregivers are visiting Stratton to discuss their experiences in various schools around the world, which aligns with the EL module schools around the world. We're also holding regular principal coffees, providing families with opportunities to connect directly with school leadership, share feedback, and strengthen the school family partnership. Thank you. We welcome your questions at this time. Okay. Uh, committee questions, comments? Ms. Exton. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, and it's exciting to see so many of you here. Um, I mostly just have two comments. Um, I want to, I just, I very much appreciate how much um, both last year and this year you've shared about the SLC and the focus on supporting that program and supporting the students being included um, at, at Stratton. I, it's, I know that it's a, a challenging population to work with and include, and I think it was, um, there was a big need there, and so the incorporation of Playworks, the work that um, you've been doing um, with inclusion um, and supporting students is, is um, I very much appreciate it, and I also, as a parent of a Stratton student, have noticed um, the change um, over the last few years. The other thing I wanted to comment on, mostly unrelated, um, is your enthusiasm for EL. Um, I think, is, as a teacher myself, it is so hard to <laughs> um, to learn a new curriculum, and I know um, how much work you put in. Those of you that did it last year put into it, um, and I think it's a it's a huge lift. And I know all the schools are doing this, but I sort of have a personal <laughs> awareness of it here. Um, a huge lift for an entire school to take on a new curriculum. Um, all at once. So I, your coach, your ELA coach isn't here. I think your ELA coach is here. Um, I know how much work um, is you all are putting into that. And I guess my question of that is you've talked so much about the like working together, right? Planning together, pushing in to do these supports, collaborating with the SLC. Do you f I know the answer is no, but do you feel like you have the time <laughs> to do that or do that well or? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, there's never enough time. Uh, and the, I mean, I think we're utilizing the time that we have incredibly well. And these teachers are amazing. They come prepared and ready to dig into the work and plan together. Um, our, as you mentioned, you know, Shannon O'Brien, our um, coach, has been uh, just incredible at supporting this work. And I am struck daily by the enthusiasm of the teachers around the implementation. And I think some of that is contagious. Um, I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really excited about what this will bring for us, is bringing and will continue to bring. No, and don't. we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> that is hard. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that and I appreciate your honesty. And um, I'll just add, uh, as I work in a district who hasn't made the shift to a new ELA curriculum and all the teachers are panicking um, and I just keep trying, I don't know, don't know what curriculum I'll choose, but I keep saying it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I appreciate all the work that you all have done for that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Al Samanthi. So my question actually relates to some data that's in your report, not in your presentation. Since I brought up the uh, panorama stuff for, the, for Bracket, I was looking at yours. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on why I, I can see that sense of belonging dropped a lot, school climate dropped a lot, and I'm just wondering if you could talk about why that is and what you're doing to, I mean, I know you've talked about some of this stuff, but just what's going on? I think there was a big number, a big difference in our participation numbers, unfortunately. I don't know that that answers at all, um, but I do think that that is, that does have something to do, do with it. Um, I, I'll tell you an interesting thing that I've heard a lot from kids. Uh, 
I think that they equate um, I'm, I'm I am trying to be thoughtful about how I say this at this hour. Uh, I, I have heard them say often, we liked it a lot better when there were no rules. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I didn't know how, how else to say that. But I think that we have, when I started at Stratton, I heard consistently from teachers and families that they were concerned about um, a, a lack of structure and uh, expectations around uh, around school related behavior and we've worked, worked really hard to build a system of expectations and I don't know that they always love that um, and in the end we are they are safer they are supported um, and the younger students are really growing accustomed to the expectations. I think kiddos who had been there for several years with some different structures find some of the structure. Um, you know, it's, it's, they, they don't love it as much. Okay, thank you. I, don't, I hope that answers here. I, mean, I can only be honest. Uh, Ms. Gittleson. I just wanted to say, I, as the parent of a second grader at a different Arlington Elementary School who has found the module on studying schools around the world, like I've never heard my kid talk this much about school. He, like that just sounds so great that you're using your, the caregiver community to like bring that in even further. I know that in my child's classroom they've you know, there are students who have been able to bring some of that perspective, but I think it's great that to do it even on a bigger scale. The second grade team came up with that idea and, and structured this whole uh, panel. We're excited about it. Anything else from the committee? I want to speak to something that the Ms. Go ahead. Uh, superintendent wants to speak and then I have a question. Okay. Um, just to the point that Ms. Exton brought up about time, one of the things that I think can be a little hard to see but that both groups have talked about is how you're structuring time. Could you talk a little bit about how you built the schedule this year? Because you had also asked about collaboration and I think that it speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? I'm putting you on the spot. I didn't tell you I was <laughs> no, going to ask you No, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, you did a lot of the scheduling. I, I, no, I'm, I'm happy you did. Are you asking more about the how we literally the like process, the academics, the process. how you oh, built it at the I, at ILT? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at ILT last spring, um, Ms. Kelly and Dr. O'Brien gave us some. If you could do what you wanted, and what would your day look like? What would be best for your students in um, knowing, you know, there's a new EL curriculum for whichever grade and how would that work best for us? And we were kind of given like a, a wish time and we got to schedule out knowing that there's an um, hour module block, there's an hour skills block or all block and then where would your math block work? And we were given that freedom to kind of really best plan, then take into account our grade level colleagues below and above us. So we had to be mindful of the whole school, which was a really great exercise for all of us, but also to think about what worked well for a first grader, which worked well for a fifth grader, and how we could start <coughs> our day with breaks and specials, and it was really a great exercise for all of us, and we tried to utilize you know, the kids' learning time, when's a good time for a break, how to put an hour block of this in, and I think that was a a great thing for a, a teacher to have con, you know some control of and then it actually worked out we weren't sure if it would but it was really nice to have that opportunity and it worked I have to say I had a different schedule last year when I piloted EL as a cohort one and now this year it is a hundred times better having it broken up is that yeah, yeah. totally that's what and, I and one of the things that came out of that work is that we were able to stagger our instructional blocks so that our interventionists are truly on like wheels 
going from one grade to the next grade to the next grade to the next grade to support this push in it's 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 not perfect next year it will be better but um, we were really mindful of trying to maximize the adult support for co-teaching when we created that schedule as an ILT I point that out because I think to your point about collaborative time it doesn't it you don't have it unless you're really purposeful and collaborative about the schedule build that takes a lot of trust because typically if an administrator does that then you have control over things this team gave that over um, and to also some of the points that were made in the bracket school improvement plan there's a lot of trust that goes into knowing that the educators who are in front of the students all day are going to have a sense of what the best way to organize themselves around those needs is going to be and when you do that, you, you create more collaborative time because you create opportunities for folks to learn from one another even while they're working with students. And so I just want to highlight the purposefulness with which the team has done that and to hear you narrate the impact of that. Sometimes these are hidden things in schools, um, but it's been very visible to me and I think it speaks to the question the next one's asking. Nice job. Thank you. Okay, I, my question. <coughs> I keep looking for secret, uh, secret sauce special things that are happening. And because I'm, I spent 19 years looking at MCAS data, I spot weird and interesting things. And the weird and interesting thing I'm spotting in your data are your fifth grade fractions, <coughs> which blow the doors off of the world. <laughs> what are you doing for fractions in fifth grade? Abby. Abby. <laughs> I don't even teach math. It's pretty good. I mean, you're, you're, you're <laughs> two two and a half times the state ratio on uh, solving real world problems involving multiplication of fractions. I mean, well, you know, really, you, you, you're blowing the doors off the fractions. Well, um, I, I have to be honest, and this is, I probably shouldn't admit this. Um, I, I don't know that I've looked as much at the, at the places where we've blown the doors off of things as I have at the areas for improvement. So I think I will do that. And uh, in addition, I'm going to talk with bracket folks about their 97% belong or <laughs> belonging. Uh, we really have a lot to learn from them there. So, um, but we'll I'll look into it. Yeah, I, I don't. Look at deficit models. I look at educators. seeing where the strengths are and where we can go and sort of spread it around. So let's talk about fractions. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I think we just have a really passionate group of kids about math at Stratton. We're really fortunate in that way. I think it comes from the teachers in a lot of ways. There's just a growth of math ideas and a commitment as a community to maybe like finding those real world applications. Mm -hmm. um, and I think fractions is a really easy place to do that um, because there's fractions in the real world in a lot of ways and the kids are eager to spot those connections and so I think we make an effort to I think the kids are smart <laughs> but also we make an effort to um, incorporate those real world applications more as a team kids get smart because of your efforts Stuart do you want to just I'm sorry to put you on the spot but do you want to just talk a tiny bit about the pilot we're doing with fractions in the I, I don't want to put you all on the spot, but just uh, at this point, uh, be it known that it's been spotted and I'm sure that people are going to be knocking on your door. I can talk a, a tiny bit about our intervention work with Fractions too. We have programs where we, we have some pre-teaching um, review and pre-teaching as a Fractions unit is coming up. Mm -hmm. Our intervention team uh, works with small groups to do some review and pre-teaching so that when that unit opens and they're in their classroom, they're ready to learn and prepared. So they're not, they're not starting behind the starting line, they're right there with mm -hmm. their class. And then the class moves forward and, and a lot of that intervention work and, and pre-work is done so, so they can step right in and, and think along with their classmates. And, and share and collaborate with the work that's going on there. Excellent, excellent. Keep it up. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, 
Thank you very much, Stratton School, for the presentation. Thank you. As it is let the school teams go. Hmm? Yeah, I was gonna help you. I was hoping they would get out. Gotta get up early in the morning. Yeah, I mean all, all you uh, folks, it's past your bedtime, so go home and go to bed. Get ready for EL tomorrow. Get some sleep. Oh, I, one thing I neglected to do at the beginning of the meeting because I didn't see in the Zoom box is Jenna Medeiros is our AEA rep. She is not sitting in a chair in the room. She's sitting in the Zoom box. Uh, hello, Jenna. We're glad to see you. Also, Dr. Al, or not Dr. Allison Elmer, our assistant superintendent for special education, student support, and other good things of that nature is online. Uh, in, in a Zoom box, Mr. Spiegel's in a Zoom box, and uh, Miss Pierre's in a Zoom box. She broke her knee, so uh, <laughs> we we hope that she has uh, rapid hearing, healing, and um, returns soon. Okay, Superintendent, we're next up for for <coughs> more math fun. All right, I'm going to hand this out over to Dr. Ford Walker pretty promptly here, um, but we know that the committee has gotten a lot of questions and commentary about math instruction at the secondary level, particularly in grade six. We wanted to take an opportunity to answer some of the questions that have come before the committee, respond to some of the suggestions that um, have been shared, as well as provide an update on some of the work that we're doing in sixth grade math in particular, but also throughout uh, secondary math. It is, it, it, while, you know, certainly we, value the feedback that we have received and we think it is exceptionally important that all of our students be challenged in all of our content areas. Uh, this is timely also because it was in our priority one goals for this year to be taking a very close look at pathways, particularly in math, particularly in middle school. Um, and so we knew this conversation was coming. It has been planned for many years. It's in the strategic plan. Um, we're not going to dig very deeply into an exploration of pathways, but we do have a little bit of an update to share on that tonight. Um, I wanna thank members of our administration who have spent a lot of time um, combing through everything we've received, thinking through the action steps we're going to take, be exceptionally thoughtful in their responses and the time that they've taken, particularly with families, to listen to some of the concerns that have been raised and have been raised here to all of you. Um, as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ford Walker. Get Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this evening, Math and Computer Science Director Octavia Bronner and Dr. Sam Hoyo, Director of Science, and I will be providing an update on current math and science programming within the district. We will also share some of the feedback that the district has been receiving around programming and pathways, uh, the sixth grade math bypass assessment, and share our initial short and long-term plans to address some of the concerns presented and challenges faced. Uh, we wanna make sure to highlight that tonight's presentation and the work of both departments and our educators is rooted in APS's mission and vision and APS's five-year strategic plan, specifically strategic priority one, ensuring equity and, ex and excellence. Um, with that said, I'll invite Ms. Bronner to share a little bit about our hopes for all of our math learners in APS. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford Walker. Um, so if you go back to the previous slide really quickly, thank you. Um, I just want to say around the mission and the vision of the Arlington Public Schools is the work that we're doing in the department for math and computer science is very much grounded in this mission and this vision. Um, our goal is to stay grounded in that um, and that whittles down from everything to uh, feedback around evaluations, to department meeting, to any professional learning that we're providing um, for the staff. So we really do ground it in that. So there's not necessarily a separate mission for the math department, but our goals this year are specifically thinking about areas around student engagement and academic discourse, which I think follow a lot of the goals that are um, that the schools have this year. I know Dr. Janger is working on academic discourse at the high school, and Brackett talked about um, positioning academic discourse as a as a goal this year for staff. Um, and really, the framing for that goal comes from thinking about helping students create identity 
around not just being math learners, but also being mathematicians or uh, math doers. So currently in grades K to five, uh, we are using Turk Investigations 3 um, in grades 6th, 7th, and 8th. We're using the Amplified Desmos uh, math curriculum. And of course, in grades 9 through 12, the content varies um, by course. Um. All right, so, um, so as Dr. Homan said, we're gonna provide a little bit of context around what our current pathways are um, at the secondary level, and then talk about some of the work that we've been doing to increase um, access to some of our courses, um, including courses within the science department. <coughs> so I wanted to provide um, a little bit of framing around what we do in Arlington Public Schools and that it stems from what the state is asking us to do. So in grades six through eight, we'll actually get grades K through eight, um, the standards are based by grade level, so they're not named specific courses. Um, and then once you get to the high school level, there's, a di there's two pathways that the state presents, and the one that we use, that we implement, is the considered a model traditional pathway, and that's what most people are familiar with, naming courses Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and then thinking about those advanced courses, um, pre-calculus and calculus. The other pathway is that integrated pathway. So you have year one, year two, and year three. So there are some districts in the state that use that, but most districts um, follow this traditional pathway. And then just sort of thinking of the framing of what students need to graduate. Um, at Arlington High School, they just need to pass three years of math, which include Algebra one and Geometry. Um, math Core recommends four units of math, and as part of that four units, they recognize computer science as a, as a unit in that way. And most of our students are graduating with at least four units um, of math. And so, um, so this slide presents the different pathways that are currently available uh, to students. Um, starting in grade six, the majority of students take, the, take math six. Um, and then there's two uh, places that they can go in seventh grade. And last year was the first year we really um, uh, took heart to what the district would like to do with allowing students to do challenge by choice. Um, in other words, the teachers could help guide the students in making that choice, but we're not making a specific recommendation and sort of locking students in, telling them that this is the course that best suits them, allowing families and students to make that decision together. Um, so the grade level pathway is math six to math seven, math eight and algebra one. Our Math 7A is considered our accelerated pathway. Math 7A covers all of Math 7 and a large portion of the Math 8 um, curriculum. And then when students get to Algebra 1, they do about a unit and a half to two units of Math 8 and also the Algebra 1 curriculum before getting to the high school. Uh, where they can enter into geometry, either selecting to go to that A level, which is the college prep, or into an honors course. Um, and then the bottom row there is our bypassing pathway where students um, were invited to skip or bypass math six and go into math seven A. So they are starting in sixth grade when they're doing that in that accelerated pathway, and that positions them to take algebra two as freshmen. So the questions have been around what are the different options for students? Um, and it's not always clear based off of what is presented in the program of studies of what are all the different options for students. And so a large part of the work this year has been supporting the teachers understanding what the different pathways are for their students moving forward when they're making their, not recommendations, but um, having conversations with students around what their next choice of their course is, um, supporting the counseling department at the high school, understanding what the different pathways might be and what the implications of one path over another might be. And this year um, was the first year when students were registering for this current school year, when they were registering and making course choices in the spring, um, a couple teachers asked, can students choose to double up in 10th grade with geometry and algebra two? And I know that 
prior to my arrival in the department, this was a practice that was occasionally allowed. Um, and after speaking with geometry teachers, algebra two teachers, the guidance counselors, making the decision to allow students to choose this pathway with no barrier. There was no need to apply or get approval. Um, I did try to keep track of which students were making this choice to sort of just think about them as a cohort and what, that, uh, what their math journey might look like moving forward. Um, the thing, couple things to note is that along the pathways, we're still allowing students to choose whether they want to do a college prep or that A-level or the honors course at any point moving along those pathways. Um, there's things to think about, right? There's things to think about in if I'm jumping from a college prep course to an honors course, what are the implications of that? There's what are the implications of if I'm taking honors math and four AP courses, right? So there, we're trying to support students in making decisions that aren't just isolated in, in the math department, but thinking more about your whole schedule, what are your goals, um, what are you hoping to do before you leave um, Arlington High School? And then you can see in the bottom row, that's the extension of the students who did the bypassing program. Those students are reaching calculus um, in 11th grade. The one thing to note that I didn't mention is the doubling up um, option allowed those students who didn't do the accelerated pathway in middle school, they enter ninth grade in algebra one, that doubling up, the goal of that was to allow students, if they wanted to, to have access to calculus by the time they graduate from high school. And then some other courses of note that are electives. Um, we offer statistics at both a college prep level and an AP level. Um, we also have um, a section of linear algebra and a section of number theory. All three of these courses are open to any student who would like to take them as long as they've taken algebra two, they've completed algebra two. Um, and many students take these courses concurrently with pre-calculus or calculus, but they can also be taken as standalone courses. and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hoyle. Good evening. So what I wanted to highlight here uh, first is what the sequence for a traditional student would be at the high school. All our students come in taking physical science. This class is called physical science for historical reasons, and if you'd like me to, I can get into that. But it is essentially an introductory physics course that teaches students one-dimensional physics. At the completion of ninth grade, students will then enter biology, and beginning in 10th uh, grade, students can begin to take science electives. We have many students um, taking two, if not three, classes of science uh, throughout grades 10 through 12. Traditionally, after biology, students would take chemistry. Again, many of our students are taking elective courses in addition to taking chemistry. Chemistry is not a graduation requirement. However, most students who are planning to go on to higher education, whether that be a two or four year college, are choosing to take chemistry. And then finally, in 12th grade, we offer many, many electives. For the physics program, again, ninth grade is this one-dimensional physics. Starting in 10th grade, students have the opportunity, opportunity sorry, of taking either AP Physics 1 or AP Physics 2. And I'll get into what those are and what the differences are between that and AP Physics C in a moment. Um, and there's no... Uh, real reason to whether to take AP Physics 1 or AP Physics 2 first. Uh, College Board does recommend taking AP Physics 1 first. However, they deal with entirely different concepts, so you could do either or. Um, we also offer a third physics course, which is uh, two-dimensional physics for students who are not wanting to take it at the AP level. And then senior year, uh, we do offer AP Physics C. So what I have here is just an offering, um, a comparison of what is taught in AP Physics 1, 2, and 3. Having taught AP Physics 1 and having sat through Physics C, 
I do believe that AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2 are better physics courses. They allow students more time to truly understand the concepts as well as allowing students more time to engage in these hands-on activities which, which would help uh, solidify concepts and understanding. AP Physics 1 is a, essentially a mechanics course. Um, they need algebra and trig, but no calculus. And it has a moderate pace and has an emphasis in conceptual understanding and analytical skills. AP Physics 2 is very similar to AP Physics 1 in its structure. The difference is the concepts and the topics that are taught. In AP Physics 2, it's essentially electricity and magnetism along with modern physics. The math needed is the same. AP Physics C, technically there are two AP Physics C courses. We have AP Physics C Mechanics and AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism. You'll notice the naming of that AP Physics C class is very similar to what is covered in AP Physics C, uh, 1 and 2. And that's because they are covering the same concepts. The difference is what math you need in order to solve for the different variables you're looking for. AP Physics C, and because of the calculus, it allows you to solve more complex problems where in AP Physics 1, for example, uh, your velocity will stay constant as you're solving the problems. AP Physics C, because of the calculus, what you can do is you can actually have the um, velocity changing over time. And so that's where the calculus piece comes in. But the concepts are the same. And I, I do want to note that we're talking about uh, many of these electives in science um, as if they are always um, offered. Um, we don't always have the opportunity to offer courses especially the electives. This has to do with budgetary reasons, staffing, and enrollment. So I do want to make the committee aware of that as well. All right. So um, some of the conversation has been around allowing students to have access to courses that we offer, right? So I talked a little bit about what we could do to make sure that all students have access to calculus. Um, and so recent conversations have been around how do we allow students um, or support students getting access to that uh, physics, that AP Physics C course. Um, so Dr. Hoyo, Dr. Janger, and myself, um, in collaboration with Dr. Ford Walker and Dr. Homan, have been talking about what are possible pathways to allow students to get to that. Um, and what we have here in the slides tonight are some of the first initial possibilities um, it's not limited to these. We're still exploring and making sure that we're considering a lot of other options. The doubling up option, for instance, in 10th grade means that students don't get to take a different elective. They're really doubling up in math, and the consequence of that would be that they don't get to take another course. So we know for every student that's not an ideal option. Um, up until this point, um, in order to get students to calculus, if they've uh, reached Algebra 2 by 11th grade, they've been offered the opportunity um, to find or take a pre-calculus course using an approved program that was previously approved. Um, pri again, prior to my arrival, that was um, set up. So we're using that as a way to say, what does that look like and who's excluded, right? Who doesn't get to take these courses because the summer course might not fit for certain students or families. Um, so this is our starting point, thinking about what are some of those options. So we that top row is the same as it has been. Summer work as a, in a pre-calculus course could get students to taking calculus their senior year. Um, Dr. Hoya and I have talked about what the summer might look like. Do you want to speak to that for uh, the? I have another slide coming up. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thinking about what students in Physics C really need are those calculus skills. So after pre-calculus, what's one option for supporting them getting those skills so that they can focus on the science content and not as much on learning the math in the Physics C, 
but they would also be taking a calculus course. So there's still benefit from learning calculus beyond just that skill uh, level. And then obviously, again, I like to keep that bottom row in there. Uh, what does it look like for the students who, who participated in the bypassing program? So this is similar in, in terms of the shift here is it instead of doing coursework between 11th and 12th grade, um, students could take a pre-calculus course between 10th and 11th grade um, and then actually take calculus in 11th grade and do that physics C in 12th grade. Um, and then in 12th grade, in addition to that, they have those other electives available to them so they could take another math course, that being the AP statistics, um, linear algebra, and number theory. Did you, when was your? It's coming. Okay. Keep okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to Dr. Hoyle. All right, so an update on our bypassing um, Math 6 program. Um, so this program was developed as an optional. Parents were notified of previously, sorry, let me start over. So the program historically has been this optional program where families opt their child in to taking an assessment to see if they're ready to skip, if they have the skills needed to skip sixth grade math and go into Math 7. Um, the, the reason I put not a placement test up there is because not every student is taking it. We're not placing all students. This is an optional um, assessment that's designed for skipping an entire year of math. And that we view that differently than acceleration. So when we talk about acceleration, we're not talking about skipping content. We're talking about moving through the content at a different rate. And so that acceleration occurs, an example of that would be that Math 7A course where students are covering all of the seventh grade content and a lot of the eighth grade content. So you can imagine that course is, is actually accelerated in terms of moving at a faster pace. Um, so this past year was the first year that I um, administered the test and participated as an administrator in the program. Um, so Madam Pierre Maxwell at Gibbs and I put together an email that would be, uh, that was sent out to all families. Um, the goal, we, ex um, we communicated through the information that we gave families that the, the, the program is really designed for students who've demonstrated consistent MCAS scores in the exceeding category, um, and that we were looking at students showing evidence of both mastery of this skill, but also mastery of reasoning of those sixth grade um, standards. Um, and that the cohort size is undetermined. We didn't, students were not competing against each other to get into this class. So what was different this year was in prior years, the assessment had been um, administered after school um, on a couple days. I think there was multiple days offered for flexibility, um, but students and their families came after school during some time out of school hours, had to travel to the high school, for instance. I know they hosted it here one year. Um, the difference this year is we, um, Dr. Ford Walker and I worked about to talk about like how we open this option up to more families um, and give more students uh, the opportunity to at least participate in the program. So we delivered the assessment at all seven schools. Um, I think there, there was nothing else to say there, sorry. And then um, the scoring was completed in June, the results went out in June as well, and then there was a number of families who wanted to um, discuss the results of their child and those meetings happened over the summer. Um, the assessment was scored by a team of directors. That team is sitting here right now, Dr. Hoyo and I. And then there were um, some elementary math coaches that helped score the multiple choice portion of that to help move the scoring process along a little bit faster. Um, the rubric was aligned with previous year's scoring. Um, I worked closely um, with um, Dr. Coleman to go through how he'd previously scored the assessment and the goal of each question and what he was looking for from each question. Um, I talked to him about his percent um, scoring rate previously and I lowered our percent acceptance, um, what the score needed to be, I lowered that threshold from the previous years. Um, the scoring is based both on correct answers as well as work or explanations that support those answers. Um, that was where that re there's the, the sixth grade skill and then the sixth grade reasoning um, standards come in there. Um, <coughs> 
So because the district has moved away from teacher recommendations at the secondary level for courses, it made sense to follow um, a similar path in terms of teachers recommending students to skip sixth grade math. Um, the MCAS scores, while we do, we do look at those just to see where students are, the MCAS scores are not a good indicator of, of which students were ready to skip sixth grade math and which weren't. Um, and they really, those are a me measure of that grade level work. It's hard to determine if a student is ready for seventh grade math or if they have all those sixth grade skills um, just by looking at their MCAS scores from fourth and fifth grade. Um, IXL, we didn't use that as an assessment tool because that's only available currently at the middle school and it's used more as an instructional tool. Um, and another thing to note is we started using IXL during the pandemic and there's not, we're, we're, we're working on right now this year is to sort of norm how we're using IXL and how we're um, using the data from IXL to drive instruction. Um, and then last year, I don't remember exactly when we stopped using iReady, but I know that we didn't use iReady last year. And then here's a table mapping out the historical data around the number of students who opted to take the assessment, and then the number of students who performed well enough that they were invited to bypass Math 6. Um, so you can see that it remains roughly consistent throughout the different years. Um, noting that this past year, we uh, more than doubled the number of students who were taking the um, assessment, so many more students opted in to, to try that. Um, but the number of students that, that um, met that threshold uh, for demonstrating mastery and reasoning um, was around the same number, slightly fewer than the last couple of years. And then there's been a lot of feedback from about the process from the family. So this has been a, a good opportunity for learning where families are, um, learning their concerns, and um, trying to figure out as a district and as a department how we respond to those concerns. Um, so one of them was that this was the only measure used to offer invites to bypass Math 6. As I said in a previous slide, we didn't use teacher recommendations. MCAS wasn't really a good measure of showing mastery of sixth grade content. Um, and we no longer have iReady uh, available to us. Um, a few other things were students were expressing anxiety when not accepted or they really wanted to be uh, with their classmates of similar abilities. And so those two bullet points, um, the administration at the Gibbs School has worked really hard to try to partner um, with the students and the families to support students through that. Um, students are not feeling challenged in math class. That's something that I've really taken to heart in thinking about what does our math program look like? What's, what does it look like for students to learn math in fifth grade? What does it look like for them to learn math in sixth grade and, and beyond? Um, there was not agreement on sort of what the process as it was outlined, um, how invitations were, were being sent to students, um, not maybe feeling there was full um, understanding of what we were looking for in the assessment in, in terms of like accuracy of answers versus also showing thinking. Um, and then a, a big concern around students who didn't do that bypassing if they wanted to be able to take AP Physics C their senior year um, they, as it stands right now, they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that because they would need calculus junior year. So some additional math learning um, enrichment and opportunities um, outside the classroom. There's many math clubs and teams. There's actually a sixth through eighth grade math club that runs um, in the evenings. There's a community parent uh, volunteer who um, heads that up. And then a lot of our other clubs are at the high school. So we have the coding club, girls who code, a robotics club. They, they vary a little bit from year to year depending on if there's a staff member that's willing to be their advisor. Um, and there is a math club that students are wanting to start at, at Audison for the seventh and eighth graders. Um, other spaces for learning include using IXL um, and Dreambox, and then the department at the, at the secondary level, we're really looking at what are different opportunities we can provide to students in, in terms of both enrichment, um, but also in terms of just with the curriculum around uh, deeper learning, uh, more challenge. Oh, and then the last, I'm sorry, I didn't read that. 
Um, so the school, as well as the department, really would like to welcome community members interested in starting any additional extracurricular opportunities for students at the middle level. I know there's a lot of um, math evenings or math mornings that are hosted or run by community members at different elementary schools, and so it would be um, really great to sort of branch that up into those middle grades as well. I know the students would really appreciate that. And I just want to note, linked to that, that we are trying to do that also with our, with, like within our own staff and we'll offer stipends and such, but sometimes we don't get takers on some of those things. And so we start there and we also know that community members being involved in this has really enriched a lot of opportunities for students and I just wanted to name that. Just a, a quick update regarding AP Physics C. Um, due to the work that the math department um, and Ms. Brana have done, we have decided that while AP Physics C does require a strong foundation in physics, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's late, in calculus, um, we are going to try to figure out a way for students to gain some of those skills um, so that they will be uh, able to take AP Physics C without having taken calculus. That being said, um, it is really important for you all to know, for students to know, for families to know that the AP Physics C teacher is there to teach physics um, they cannot teach the math and the physics simultaneously. There's just not enough time. And so it's going to be really important for students to engage in this skills camp, or I'm not, I'm not sure what we're going to call it yet, but to really try to gain those mathematical skills over the summer. Um, students will not be excluded from taking AP Physics C, uh, even if they don't have it, it's just an understanding that they're going to struggle a lot more if they do not have that uh, calculus background. Great, thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Bronner and Dr. Hoyo. Um, so I just wanna share a little bit in terms of the district's response. I wanna continue to expand on what was shared already and also share um, our future plans and ideas around next steps. Um, so in partnership with the grade six math educators at Gibbs, uh, Ms. Bronner has already begun a curriculum review um, and that review has included looking at scope and sequences, visiting classrooms, observing, providing feedback to educators um, and also there's a day of planning or half day of planning, excuse me, um, that's scheduled for tomorrow in order to take a look at practices that are currently in place um, uh, involving uh, our grade six math only um, at this moment, but we have plans to extend that uh, to seventh and eighth as well in the future. Um, and also, we are planning to um, continue to make sure that there's a partnership taking place between Ms. Bronner and the Gibbs team, specifically as it relates to the instructional leadership team. So we saw that Ms. Bronner was here tonight supporting Bracket, and she will also be joining uh, Gibbs as well in order to work directly with the leadership team there as well as educators um, around making sure that we are supporting learners and providing more opportunities for uh, universal design and differentiation. Also, we will identify alternative options for acceleration and extension in middle school, particularly at sixth grade. Um, we recognize that um, we can figure out ways to expand programming and we are committed to doing that. Um, we are working on assessing and determining future, um, the future of the Math 6 Bypass program um, and also we are working on developing a plan for community engagement. We're currently reviewing pathways to ensure access to advanced coursework to um, Calculus and Physics C and we will continue to review curriculum and instruction to ensure our adherence to grade level standards across uh, K to five. We will also be conducting an administrative review of middle school mathematics. We are committed to prioritizing middle school at this moment with plans in the future to take a look at elementary curriculum. Um, also, we will make sure that we're working to interrogate 
the extent to which students have access to grade level standards um, and grade level instruction. Um, and we will continue to do that by visiting classrooms, providing feedback, engaging in uh, instructional rounds that are centered around um, this particular problem of practice and also centered around um, ensuring that we are providing grade level instruction to all of our students. And we'll also continue to interrogate tracking practices at middle school. Um, we are committed to reviewing department structures, practices, and procedures. As I said, Ms. Bronner will be continuing that work tomorrow with her team. Um, she's already begun that work. We will also be, as I mentioned before, conducting classroom walkthroughs. Um, and those have started this week, which we're super excited about, which hopefully you'll share in your superintendent update. Um, but those include walkthroughs and rounds with leaders, principals, assistant principals, and other educators and leaders within the district. Also, uh, we will be focusing department time centered on ensuring that we are looking at student engagement, academic discourse, and grade level standards, um, and ensuring that our instruction is reflecting grade level standards. And department professional development opportunities and making sure that we're providing those opportunities that are particularly structured um, in ways that meet needs of our educators. And finally, I'm excited to share that we'll be partnering with DESE in their Advanced Learner Pilot Program. Um, this program is a multi-year partnership which is focused on um, supporting five to six districts in developing a better understanding of advanced learning um, and making sure that uh, Tier 1 practices are um, strengthened in order to provide Tier 2 and Tier 3 services um, to our learners. Um, also, the partnership will allow us to work closely with DESE to uh, participate in observations, um, feedback sessions, and also uh, we will make sure that um, we are working to make sure that the district's priorities are in alignment with the actual offering of this program, um, specifically as it relates to utilizing multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, and finally, um, before we open it up to questions, I do want to um, take a few minutes to thank our students, thank our families um, and our staff, and thank you to our community members for sharing their concerns. Um, and also, um, I um, am appreciative of hearing of current and past practices as it relates to teaching and learning um, in APS. I do want to reiter reiterate that we are committed to partnering with each of you to address concerns shared and challenges faced. Um, I'd also like to thank both of our directors, Octavia Bronner and Dr. Sam Hoyle for your efforts in your leadership um, in keeping students at the center. And finally, I'd like to thank our school leaders and our educators who are working hard to meet the needs of all of our learners every single day. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation and also continuing the co collaboration um, in pursuit of our district goals as outlined in the strategic plan, as well as our district mission and vision. Thank you. Thank you. Sue, if, if you need to leave, you know, yeah, please yeah. do. No, I, know. I know these mean teachers at the high school give you a ton of homework. I'll show you too. Yeah. If, if you're happy staying with us, please stay. But if you need to leave or sleep or do whatever it takes to be ready for high school in the morning, Go for it. Okay, committee. Um, questions, comments from the committee? That's interesting. I'm going to comment then. Uh, you're, you're, I, I'm a licensed math teacher in two states. Uh, and I've taught high school math. I've taught third grade. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> <laughs> I can't work here. Oh. It's a conflict of interest. Right. Um, when I taught a high school, we did a re uh, in New Jersey. We did a very rigorous physics course in freshman year, and the math curriculum was aligned deliberately to the physics curriculum. So we were bouncing around between books and introducing topics that would not have been in a normal algebra one sequence. And I thought it was quite effective. And when I was doing extra help as a math teacher, it was usually a physics problem that came to me. 
uh, people <coughs> looking for physics answers. But uh, my expertise on the math side, not on the physics side. I don't know what a physics C is. This is all <laughs> this is all new to me. I just thought there was AP physics, and I never knew that there were three three flavors of it. <coughs> um, so I'm still learning. Number two. One of the things that the open meeting law blesses us with is the fact that I cannot communicate with my colleagues or offer my opinion to my colleagues or state my opinion in a manner that it is going to uh, rotate back to my colleagues uh, except within the context of a public meeting because of the open meeting law. People have a right to hear deliberations and the opinions of their elected officials. And in this case, I'm opinionated because this is a field that I've worked in and I love very much. Uh, personal opinion is that we shouldn't be tracking in grade six. We shouldn't be bypassing in grade six. It's too early. It's too early to make that determination. Kids grow at a different rate and to take a picture or a snapshot of a child at the end of fifth grade and make such a long-term determination about their math career going through physics and calculus, it is the wrong time. We should not be doing it. It's, I, I also view it as contrary to our commitment to uh, MTSS and strong tier one instruction because if I go and all of a sudden divide the group here and I only talk to the people on this side of the room, Jane and I have a lot in common, but I'll never talk to her. And at sixth grade, that's too early. Grouping can be more flexible in high school. And in fact, we can do a lot of things in high school, particularly grade 10 and above, because we're dealing with electives that we can't do in grades 6, 7, 8, and 9. We can semesterize our math instruction. So through two, do two double block uh, mm -hmm. classes, we can do ge uh, uh, algebra 2 in the fall and pre-calc in the spring. We can do those kind of things by doing double blocks. So no child needs to be blocked from calculus regardless of where they are entering in ninth grade. Another opinion of mine. Next opinion, the MCAS scores for last year in sixth grade in the Gibbs were outstanding and I am particularly impressed with the constructive response scores. We're at 150 percent of the state average. It's really something to get up to 120. We're at 150. We're blowing the doors off of constructive response, which means that there's a, a, a focus in the sixth grade on mathematical discourse. You can't get that score without a focus on mathematical discourse, and that is an important thing to happen. I understand the philosophy of doing that. I think it's a proper thing to do. I'm proud of those scores. I think it's a marker that we're doing the right thing. Um, those are my opinions. Um, I would do away with this bypass test. I would do away with the bypass at sixth grade. I think it's wrong. My experience as a math educator, I think it's wrong because kids develop very differently in math. Having taught high school algebra and geometry, I know they're totally different aptitudes and kids who don't do well in algebra can often do wonderfully in geometry and kids who are storming through algebra all of a sudden hit geometry and they crash and burn. They're different things and the, the mix is important and my sister was just storming through advanced math all along until she got about to 11th grade and then she fell apart. We don't know where the kid is going to fall at 6th grade. And I think that if we will have a stronger math program, if we're not separating out kids from their peers when they are talented and we've got a lot of talented kids, that's my opinion only. I'm one-seventh of this committee, so it really means nothing for me to have an opinion unless I have four members of this committee who are dedicated enough to my viewpoint to say this is the direction we need to go. But I 
and, and I'm not willing to go and put them in a position where they have to make a decision or think about this. This is a first step into discussing it. The curriculum subcommittee can go and take a look at it if they want. The, the administration can make a presentation if they want. People can come in here and I've talked to parents. I've had coffee. I'm open to changing my mind. I'll listen to the facts. But that's where I'm standing and this is the only place where I can say it because I'm in an open public meeting with my colleagues. Take it for what it's worth. Anyhow, anyone else want to comment? Ms. Sure. Mr. Oh, okay, we'll yeah. go, go around the room. I, I, I welcome the sure. discussion. Mr. Cardin. Oh, are we going to talk about what you're Anything talking you about? Because I want to talk about what I want to talk about. You could, yeah, <laughs> I, I was shocked that nobody else is talking. Uh, so, no, Mr. Thank Cardin, you. you go. Thanks. Uh, so, the, the subject of middle school math is a very big topic, and, you know, I don't think it's really either it's on the agenda, but it's not really on the agenda mm -hmm. tonight. Um, I think the administration has uh, committed to taking a new look at the way we do things, and I think that's appropriate. Um, these these math six concerns have been around for a long time, sort of very quietly. I just found some emails from 2017 mm -hmm. with the same issue. Um, you know, the former director, the process used to include a one-on-one -on -one interview with each student, um, a very subjective process. So I, I do think for next year, though, we do need to have a plan very soon um, and to pull away the current program without replacing it, um, I think would be harmful. And I think there are lots of things we can do to replace it, but doing that over the next six months um, seems not realistic. So I think we need to focus on very quickly on what we are going to do for next year. If, if for some reason we are doing away with this program, we need to get a lot of resources and consultants in to figure out how we're going to challenge those students within their existing, within the existing class. Um, if we're not going to pull it away, if we're going to keep it for another year, then I do think we need to look at the assessment a little bit more <coughs> closely to address some of these concerns about how it was communicated in advance, how it would be scored, and how it was actually scored. So. Um, uh, I, I thank you all for responding to the community concerns and doing a lot of work, um, and that's my opinion. Ms. Gittleson, was your no, uh, Ms. Morgan? Um, so, I, so I had a couple of questions first. So, um, speaking, I, I'm not actually all that interested in the <coughs> bypassing part. I'm much more interested in the pathways because mm -hmm. if if you don't get the bypassing right, you got to have <coughs> lots of pathways that allow you to course correct if you don't pick the right kids. <laughs> because I think we all know, I mean, you don't always pick the right kids, right? So, um, and and like, I I work in higher ed, I've, I, I really rail against age banding, which is like so much a part of K-12 and we are so dedicated to September 1st to August 30th, like those kids come hell or high water, that's what equity is, right? You're in there with your age banded, classmates and that just makes me crazy especially in the like skills driven environment like learning <coughs> math is but that aside so very quickly about the assessment so you said that you lowered the threshold this year right but the cohort size was undetermined do you know how big that cohort would have been had you not lowered the threshold so it would have been about if i didn't lower the threshold correct you kept it. Oh. You kept it um, so it's 15. It would have been, I believe, 12. Okay. So the question, I guess, so if the cohort is, if the cohort size is undetermined and it's based on a threshold, right, you either go forward with 12 or like there's a certain amount of like, oh, well, is 12 not quite enough kids to have a class? Like, I think that's the part that I like, I'm a little, like, I mean, it's great that you allowed more students in. Because the truth is, like, it is like an allowance thing, right? Kids were said, yes, you can, or no, you can't, right? So more kids were, were put into this class, but, like, at a lower threshold. So it's just, 
it, it's tricky for me because it feels like maybe it was too small of a group. So then the threshold was lowered so that you could bring more kids in. So the threshold was actually determined before we started uh, uh, grading the assessments. Okay. So Great. thinking That's about helpful. thinking about like what is it we're looking for? What does that higher percent really represent? And then also just thinking about I, I didn't score it presumably exactly the same way that my predecessor might have scored it and just allowing some more room for for that difference okay perfect yeah. all right that's really helpful the yeah. order of operations is important yeah. to me so that that clarifies that for me um and i think i, I mean full disclosure this bypass test is neither normed nor standardized either right mm -hmm. i mean it, we haven't we just haven't had that many kids take it over the years to have it be like a truly like normed I mean because you're saying oh well I excel it you know I ready isn't normed but this test isn't actually really normed either really right like I mean we, we we're not looking it's not predictive of like we're not looking to say how did these kids do like we're, we're you know you're trying to pick this group of kids when they're 10 like but there's not really like a goal right you're not saying oh we want to find the kids who are going to get 800 on their sats or who are gonna, like none of that's like really like we're not trying to use it that way right so i guess it this test isn't like it's not perfect either right no <laughs> so I, I think we all know that um so the, and the other, the other misconception that I think the school committee was given that I just want to clarify, we were told that uh, previously students were only allowed to take the assessment by invitation, which isn't true, right? It was always open to everybody. Correct. Okay, good. I just wanted to, I, I, have the, I have the receipts on that from, maybe it was years before. I know in 2018, I have, I have emails from 2018, 2020, and 2024 that all ostensibly say the same thing, which is if you would like to take this test, please sign up. So maybe that was different previous to that. I'll give my opinion when okay. it's my turn. <laughs> All right. uh, perfect. So I, I guess in terms of the pathways, I think the big, so finishing with the math six piece, as a parent of a sixth grader um, who does not feel particularly engaged or stimulated in math uh, mm -hmm. at the Gibbs School, um, you know, it, we're looking for kids to have opportunities to learn and be challenged and to, um, you know, my 10th grader, this like broke me. A couple weeks ago, he told me, mom, I'm, he's taking computer science this year and, and he's not that good at it, which is great, right? Because <laughs> it's good for him to be someplace where like all the other kids are actually like a lot better than he is. And he said to me, mom, it's like the most amazing feeling when you work at this code and you work at it and it's wrong and it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And then you like think about something and you change something and then boom, all of a sudden it just runs. And he's like, it's the greatest feeling. I have never felt this way at school before. He's in 10th grade. <laughs> and I, I just like was like, oh my God. Um, so that was hard, right? So, and, and I think about that because we want these kids to have those experiences. We want them to feel that in school. Like I, I like breezed through high school. I didn't work very hard. I went to a really selective college and it was bloody hard when I got there. And I did, I had to learn a whole bunch of material and I had to learn how to work concurrently. Right. And, and I, I love my kids and, and I love all of our, I, they're, they're brilliant. I want them to suffer a little bit. <laughs> I do. I want them to. I want them to struggle. I want them to suffer a little bit along the way, so that it's all a little bit hard, right? Like these A pluses and these ninety nines, like they like break my soul, right? I, I work in higher ed with all non traditional learners, right? They have suffered. My students that I teach every day have suffered all the way through every single day. They are, they are suffering through every single class that they take with us because they are working three jobs and they have four kids and they're doing 50 million other things, right? So I want our students to have some of those experiences as they work their way through. So I would like to find ways to do that in math. I want to find the ways to do that when they're reading Lord of the Flies, right? I want to find the ways to do that in physics. Um, so that's sort of philosophically how I feel about this. I am, as a, as a school committee member, I am uh, concerned and want to resource this problem to the extent that we can. As a parent, I'm, I'm frustrated and, and you know running out of patience a little bit. Um, so pathways, 
So why can, so we, we I, I want everybody to take calculus, that, or I want everybody to have the opportunity to take calculus. I will tell you, I really actually truly deeply care about Algebra 1. That is, when, when you work in, <laughs> when you're in higher ed, Algebra 1 is actually the thing. That's what keeps my students, they don't have the Algebra 1 skills, so they can't, they can't major in psychology because they can't pass that stats class, right? That's actually, so um, I, they end up majoring in like marketing because that doesn't require them to take stats or they can take a different course, right? So Algebra 1 is actually the thing I care about deeply. Um, so I, I, I get very protective anytime Algebra 1 comes up, I'm like, just don't screw it up because that's actually the, the mm. biggest one. So, but why, so we're talking about these pathways, right, and there is an opportunity to double up with, with geometry and algebra two in 10th grade, right, which allows students access to, to calculus by 12th grade <clears throat> if they didn't take algebra one as eighth graders, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yes, absolutely, we should do that. Why can we not offer that to ninth graders so that they can <clears throat> move forward and not have to get into this like summer shifty pre-calc like I, 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 like I have taught summer pre-calc. <laughs> I, I, I've taught it. I've tutored kids who have taken it. It is, it's hard. It's actually a lot to do over the summer pre-calc. Um, so why can't they do that in ninth grade? Why can't we offer so, that option? So to just a up? clarifying question: When you say ninth grade, are you referring to the students who are entering in algebra one? No, I'm or sorry. Or the students who are entering no, into apologies. geometry? No, no, I, you, I, sorry, don't touch my algebra one. Right? Okay. I want, I want, <laughs> like, I want a whole year for algebra yeah. one. Honestly, like, I every time I talk to Liz, I'm like, can we offer algebra one two periods a day? That's actually what I would like. I understand mm -hmm. that that is not how K-12 works and schedules and money and ah, but oh my God, if we could that's what I would do they all the algebra one they can have um, no why why can't students take algebra one as eighth graders right and then take algebra two and geometry concurrently as freshmen because it's it seems to be something that we're now far more open to 10th graders doing so that's a really good question and when I heard the feedback around that it wasn't really something I had thought a lot about um, prior to sort of hearing that tonight thinking yeah why can't we so one of the reasons we one of the reasons I wanted to really open up that doubling up in 10th grade was to ensure that students who wanted to take calculus could do that um, without having to do summer coursework. So I know that one of the concerns around doubling up freshman year has to do with the, the volume of credits in other courses that they are expected to take that first year coming in. Um, I'm not familiar with all of the, the rigidity around that and where the flexibility might be. Um, but so, so my framing was always to get students to calculus. That was really what I was thinking about. I, I haven't, like like some of you here, I didn't really know AP Physics C. I didn't know it existed. I didn't really know what it was um, until mid or late de uh, September. So offering students the ability to double up freshman year wasn't on my mind because they kids entering students entering into geometry in ninth grade would get to calculus senior year if they wanted to. So the goal out of that doubling up was really to make sure that those algebra one freshman students could take calculus before they graduated. Okay, so I guess I would really encourage you to, to think about that option. There is room in the freshman schedule. They, they do have room. A lot of them do their like fine arts credits as freshmen, which there's enormous value in that, right? Because you find out as a freshman that you really like painting, right? And then you can then do that more, right? But but I it does feel like it's the kind of thing that, that um, because the thing is, is like, yeah, they get to calculus, but like actually as somebody who teaches applied stats, if, if they double up as freshmen, they actually can have access to AP stats as seniors, right? Now, they could take AP stats concurrently as their elective as juniors, right? Like, we could do that. But, like, maybe they want to take ceramics with AP calculus. I would. Well, actually, I love calculus. But, like, if I was taking BC Calc, I might also want to take ceramics, right? That might be kind of nice. But then, so I, all of the ways that we can give students the ability to be flexible. And again, it's not gonna work for every student. If you wanna be in the orchestra, you can't double up in math freshman year, right? It just doesn't work because you have to take orchestra as a full, if that is, becomes your elective. So also see what other districts do. Belmont teaches geometry to kids after school. They, the school runs it. They, I mean, 
not everybody's available after school, but it doesn't cost money. Um, and they teach it to interested. All, all kids can take it their eighth grade year. They take geometry after school, right? And then they go into Algebra 2 as freshmen. So there's a, there's a big group of them that do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they do in Winchester. I don't know what they do elsewhere. But like, let's go and see. We have been stuck in Arlington for such a long time in age banded math. We're like, this is how we do it. We're going to march these kids through all together because they were all born within six months of each other. And that's how it's got to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think there really feels to me tonight that this is a very different conversation than we've had about math for years. There seems to be a different kind of openness. Like there are a lot more dashed lines on those charts that you were showing us than I've, I mean, I would like more of them, right? <laughs> All the dashed lines that you can put on there. But there are more of them now than there ever have been before. Let's find more of them, right? But this, this is an opportunity to really do that. And um, so I, I appreciate the feedback. Um, I. I think that there are ways to support these kids. Um, I'm, I am deeply anxious about my sixth grader. It's really hard um, to, it, it's hard to live through this concurrently and hold both things at the same time, hold out some hope that, that actually this is like, we're, the wheels are starting to go, right? Um, and also see what he's experiencing and, and, and find it, you know, hard, right? So, um, but, all the dashed lines that we can come up with, all of the ways that we can move kids around. So thank you. Superintendent. Can I, can I add one thing just to that yeah, doubling up? Let, let me, I'm actually good. Okay, uh, go ahead. Everybody else can talk. I'll do oh, okay. it mm -hmm. um, So one of the things that when I was thinking through, like when you make a change or you allow something to happen, like you're thinking, I can't predict all of the natural consequence that might, might occur. And one thing that did end up happening is there's, um, there were 25 students who opted to double up this year. So what that meant was we needed an additional section of that Algebra yeah. 2 course. Right, so thinking about doubling up when students are taking multiple courses in the same department, that warrants needing more section of those courses. Mm -hmm. And then we reach the space where we're like, we need to, to, to increase our capacity to be able to handle that. And that, right, that comes with staffing and, and the rooms and, and other things that I haven't thought about. Which is why you asked me if I could teach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but let's resource this, right? right? No, I, mean, but, yeah. I mean, and that's the urgency that Mr. Cardin was talking about, right? Like he's talking about like, what are we, what are we gonna offer? And then I'm saying, okay, like, but, but it would be really painful if we're saying, oh, sorry, we can't do this because we can't offer you a section, right? That's not what, I, 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 I can't speak, like I don't think anybody wants that to happen, right? We have kids who wanna take math, we wanna give them flexibility. And honestly, at the end of the day, listen, like I have two kids who are in the math bypass program. They're taking pre-calc right now as sophomores. They're gonna take BC calc next year as, as juniors. And, and I actually don't know what they're gonna take as seniors. Like it truly could be ceramics, mm -hmm. right? The outcome of them bypassing mm -hmm. math six in sixth grade and going to seven A and marching their way through, it may be that the ultimate all, be all end all of that is that they take ceramics as seniors, which would be fine with me, right? That's okay. But we want to just give as much choice as we possibly can. Dr. Allison Ampey. So first to speak to what I was like, making faces at Ms. Morgan <laughs> about. <laughs> so my small uh, point of data point with this is one, when my daughters went through, there was not good, at least certainly with the first one, there was not good uh, knowledge of the existence of it. And I think it started right around um, then and then when later when it had definitely started and was going on i had one of my daughter's friends was really good at math really enjoyed it and i asked the then director you know how can she get into you know take the test or whatever and he was like well we haven't heard of her before so there's no way I don't have an email to prove that because it was a one off, but it, so to me, having, even with all the faults of having a single test with a single cutoff with people then feeling like it says their success or their failure or whatever, 
that to me feels a whole lot better than this, oh, well, we haven't heard of her. You know, she can't, you know, it was just, it was a door shut in the face. And I didn't, mm -hmm. the mom wasn't that interested in following it up and, you know, life happens and so we just let it go. Um, but I'm much happier having everyone given the same information that this is the you know this is the, if we're doing this this is how you get into it here's your chance to take this test this is what we're going to score it on and either you're in or you're out or i mean whatever your process is you know, maybe there's other things you want to consider i don't know um, but i do think it makes sense that we're not going for teacher recommendations it, if we're taking those out of other class recommendations. So that's one part. Um, I agree with Mr. Cardin that we need to figure out what we're doing next year and make sure it's understood with everyone who's coming, but also that we should be doing everything we can to support the children who are in all of our classes to make sure that they are uh, challenged and have work. Um, I don't think, and okay, and this is, this is my opinion now, right? This part of doing this is part of helping your children is making them understand what's going on and helping them work through whatever has happened. Mm -hmm. And yes, being their advocate is really important, but it's also important to help them understand what's happened and help them make the best of it, whatever that is. And, uh, but we can do our part in terms of trying to add challenge and stuff. I would like to, I mean, in terms of seeing dotted lines, I really liked what Ms. Morgan was saying about having like after school geometry class for, I mean, honestly, I'm not sure it has to even be for um, grade eight. I mean, it could be for grade seven, couldn't it? There's no reason you have to have the algebra before uh, geometry. I mean, it, it can be switched, so they could do both. Um, and so having some ways of moving these things up so that we're, I, I don't agree with Mr. Schlickman in terms of, I think we should do away with paths. I think we should make it possible for people to jump in and out of paths as their skills and interests and needs assess. Um, so there's that. I think I'd also like, just like to have a better understanding of what happens if you can't take physics C because in the past, this is again going back with the other math director. The main, the main goal of the math department was getting people potentially to calculus by the time they were a senior. And that was how everything was lined up. And so if we're now saying physics C is something that's important enough for us to totally revamp our math directions. I, I just like to know more, you know, is this really something, is this going to make a difference in terms of what college they can get into? Is it going to make a difference in terms of how they're going to do in that college? Is it, or whatever, maybe they're not going to college, but I can't, anyway, I'm just, um, it's kind of, we need to know what our goals are in terms of math and just in the past, the, the reason that we have this pathways is that the main, you know, the calculus was really the stopping point and the end of the goal. And then the quantitative reasoning and, and 
statistics were added in as something to be a goal in lieu of calculus. So I think I've said my piece. I just want to make a clarification. My, I'm totally in favor of pathways, and I love this talk of pathways. I am just yes. <clears throat> opposed to a hard track starting in sixth grade. That's, that, that was my message. Oh, okay. okay. A, a firm division at six where you're putting these kids in a, in a And no skip. one else can come in. Right. You're, you're skipping. These kids will skip sixth grade math. These kids won't. You've now established two tracks that are completely different. Right. But that, what I'm saying is <clears throat> I'm saying that's okay for that year, but I want to have. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, I, yeah, right. I mean, th I, I, I want to say one thing. That, that I am just thrilled that this school committee has been spending over an hour right now talking about teaching and learning. It is a wonderful thing, and, and I'm just so proud of uh, this committee, this administration, the leadership, the parents who brought the problem to us, uh, and, and my colleagues for engaging in this conversation. And I think this is a prime example of what a good school committee does. Mr. Thielman. Um, th thank you very much. This was a it's been a very good uh, conversation, and we have not had a conversation about the math curriculum, I think, in, in, in a while in the school committee, uh, and at, the, at this kind of level of where we're going. We've heard presentations. Um, <clears throat> it, I, mean, I think, realistically, we have to, we're not going to be changing the curriculum for this year for students, and I think we just, mm -hmm. that's not going to happen. I think we just need to be upfront mm -hmm. uh, with folks about that. Um, and the second thing, though, is, um, there needs to be uh, a kind of, a, we need to understand the timeline for your work, and it should connect somehow to our curriculum subcommittee, mm -hmm. and there should be sort of a, it, it should line up and sort of like, you know, we're gonna make a presentation to the curriculum subcommittee on, I don't know, pick a date, and then another date, another date, until, you know, three or four times until there's, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> personally, I believe, I think you're the experts that are gonna be bringing something to us mm -hmm. to respond to, and so, you know, and you're in the and you're in the building uh, with students uh, all day long. What what Dr. Allison Ampey said is correct. Historically, <clears throat> um, when conversations came up in diff at different points in time about the sixth grade uh, program and that sixth grade opportunity and how every year, you know, you, you, you often get emails as a member of the school committee. I used to get more, you know, 15 kids. I got a lot this year, uh, but only a certain number of kids uh, got into that. But we, we always heard that, you know, the, the goal was always to get every student to the point where they had the opportunity to take calculus by 12th grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like the, that was the one crystallizing mm -hmm. common theme that I, that I remember and understood. <clears throat> and so when uh, someone would come to us with a complaint, we'd say, you know, you're still going to have the opportunity to get to calculus by 12th grade. That is not, uh, you are not prevented from that, uh, that opportunity. Um, and so... That was nice and simple. It sounds like it's a lot more nuanced mm -hmm. now. So I think we need to get to a point where we have this kind of clear message um, and clear plan, uh, and the changes are made, and there's a clear kind of goal for all students with the pathways that have been articulated. I don't know if that helps you, but that's kind of what we need here. We kind of need that. That's what we need to have happen. I mean, I, and I do want I think the parents have brought up a very important issue. Um, <clears throat> And we have people that have come from all sorts of different parts of the world where, you know, math can be more accelerated. I think we, we know that, right? We know where some, it's, it's, it is more advanced in other parts of the world than it is in America. That's a fact. Um, and so we're seeing some of that here in this conversation. So that's part of the reality. Um, so thank you. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Exton. Oh, yeah. uh, no, 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 absolutely, Exton, sorry. Um, so just briefly, so I can sort of share my own opinion. I, um, so my two biggest concerns with this, with the conversation and the concerns that the parents have, have sort of brought forth from this is, um, that I don't feel like, and I think this is similar to Mr. Schligman, that, you know, a test at the end of fifth grade should determine how, um, students are then proceeding through middle school and high school um, and I you know I recognize from these pathways that there are some um, some ways to make some some movement um, and I don't know the history of why 
why this was a sixth, why it was a sixth grade bypass um, assessment, and why are we not? Why is there not another one to bypass seventh grade or another one at some other juncture um, for students? So I guess that's just as you all work to make a decision about how to move forward, um, just helping me to understand at some point, um, you know, what is it that happens between fifth and sixth grade that that was the opportunity to, to take that bypass test. Um, and then the other piece, and I'm actually just understanding from what some of you have said that the goal had always been to take, to get to calculus in high school. And I think that um, the community members have brought up a, an important piece that um, having access to AP Physics C may now mm -hmm. also be something that we really need to consider. And so I, I see from these possible pathways that there are some opportunities to, to do um, pre-calc um, in the summer. And I guess my concern with that, and so I wonder if there are other ways is, and others have mentioned this, like what if you can't have an opportunity in the summer to do that? Or is it, is it provided by the school or is it something that someone has to pay for? There are then equity issues and concerns there. Um, it sounds like Ms. Morgan mentioned something about geometry at eighth grade and in other districts and that is mm -hmm. free for, I, I guess, I don't want, I don't want access financially or time-wise to be a barrier <coughs> for students to get, mm -hmm. um, have the opportunity to get to physics C. So those are my thoughts. Anyone else? This is good. This is a good meeting. It's a good meeting. Superintendent. Dr. Ford Walker, do you Dr. have anything Ford you want to add to the discussion? I <laughs> am busy taking a while. Very notes. actively <laughs> taking <laughs> notes. You can go ahead and I can add okay. in if necessary. But please mention this stuff. Mm -hmm. This stuff's really short. You might need to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, first of all, um, I want to just name a couple of questions that have come up about the sort of ultimate goal for mathematics mm -hmm. instruction at the high school level, mm -hmm. which is still to give every student access to calculus by senior year. Um, and one of the things we've dedicated ourselves to is this idea of deeper learning, which includes mm -hmm. as much access and student choice as we can possibly build in to the resources we have. And so, we've heard, and I can see the power of, because we've visited the class, learning physics with calculus, mm -hmm. it does require the background in calculus. Mm -hmm. So that means you have to have as many flexible options and pathways as you can design. Um, I want to emphasize that what we showed tonight had some dotted lines that might be new, and we'd like to continue to explore that. That's an initial pass. Um, and one of the things that we have talked about in lots of other conversations about content has been ways we can articulate as many flexible pathways at the high school level as possible that allow students to say, this is what I'm into and I've gained such a strong foundation elsewhere in my academic career in the Arlington Public Schools that I have the ability to pursue that interest <coughs> and with depth and challenge. Now. We have heard concerns, and the things that are primary in my mind, I think these pathway conversations are important. We need to do some comprehensive planning. We need to get feedback from the community. And we want students to feel that feeling that Ms. Morgan's mm -hmm. student felt in computer science mm -hmm. as often as possible. That requires a learning culture amongst the students and the adults where it is safe to be unsure and to take academic risks. And it's safe for the adults to ask for that risk and challenge and push students uh, to struggle mm -hmm. through their coursework. Um, it, we've heard loud and clear that we need to work on that. Mm -hmm. And so, and in the way you work on that, uh, and this is an unsatisfying answer for people who want something to change tomorrow, is through concerted presence and effort and professional development and discussion with teachers and understanding their experience mm -hmm. and pushing on ideas and providing feedback on instruction on a routine basis and doing that in such a way that you invite people into the learning with you 
-hmm. And we are going to be doing that. And so we are looking forward to bringing some more ideas to you. We've given you a few possibilities. I don't think they're ideal. I don't think that we would say these are ideal. They're not ideal. Uh, because they require a student to double up, which means they're missing another class, or they require a student to take summer classes, and maybe that costs money, or we offer it, but then you have to take a summer class and you want to do something else in the summer. These are not ideal. There are other possibilities, but to Ms. Bronner's point, they cost money. Mm -hmm. Doing the instruction at the middle level in a way that balances our classrooms appropriately, provides for accessibility for students who have disabilities so that they have uh, who may have like math goals, so that they have access to grade level or higher instruction with the support required for them to be able to access that takes resources. Mm -hmm. It's going to require additional staff. It's going to require additional sections. And we're ready to propose it. Um, and it sounds like we got folks ready to support it, which is exciting. Um, and we only have so many resources. And so I think one of the things that we, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute in the superintendent's update, have talked to our administrators about is, is thinking together, which thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hoyo and Ms. Bronner, because you've been doing a lot of that with Dr. Janger and Dr. Ford Walker, about what the model is that we're after. And the model K to 12. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to start working on a pathway at the high school, you have to think about what that pathway, what sets the foundation for that pathway at the middle school so that the Algebra 1 is rock solid, so that all of the skills leading up to Algebra 1 are rock solid. The pathways we have right now, one of them does three years of middle school mathematics in one year. That's problematic mm -hmm. because that is not setting. The bypass math students essentially have three years of middle school math in a year and of grade level standard. And that's problematic in setting that foundation up for Algebra 1 and all of these possibilities that we'd love to open up to high school. Uh, and we also know that there are developmental implications that are age level based and mm -hmm. is part of where that grade banding comes from um, that has its issues and that play a role in the building of some of those skills that are so critical when students make it up into high school and into these advanced level coursework options. So we are exceptionally optimistic that by the time any of our current sixth graders make it to the high school, we will have these and other options available mm -hmm. to them. Um, and our immediate work is on the instruction and mm -hmm. the work that our teachers want and are, are doing to ensure that we build models and we build and use curriculum that is engaging every student and that we're getting feedback from the students about how that is going. So the math team is meeting tomorrow for the whole day mm -hmm. to work on this. And we're looking forward to visiting and hearing their thoughts and doing some professional development around it and bringing back to the committee uh, at least in December probably, I'll talk to Ms. Morgan about when we could do CIAA mm -hmm. and just certainly by January a plan for any adjustments we may make to next year, but this is very important. Mm -hmm. Adjustments that require a change to the scope and sequence and pacing of a course for next year, we can't do this year because we're into this year, right? Mm -hmm. So any adjustments we would make would need to not have implications for changing the content students are getting right now because we can't do that in that quick of an order. We can make adjustments that don't require that for next year, and we can start to plan for any future adjustments and pathway adjustments that we might want to make in the future, and we, then we can start to think about what the implications of that would be so that we can plan for it. We can start that work, but importantly, we wouldn't be doing anything that would require a change to the scope and sequence right now for students that are in their classes at the moment. <coughs> Mr. Schluckman, can yes. you say something? Go ahead. So um, I, I don't want to repeat anything that other committee members have said, and I think there's, this is a really important conversation. I am not a math educator like Jane. I don't have, you know, there's, there's a lot I don't know and a lot I have to learn. What I have done is worked on the college admissions side. Mm -hmm. I have read college applications mm -hmm. for MIT. 
I know how they look at applications. I wholeheartedly believe that your children are going to be fine. I know that it feels really hard right now, and I'm, I'm very invested in this issue as the parent of a second and fourth grader who are more than likely to sort of be in, in a similar position. And I don't want to minimize the fact that this is emotion, that, th that this is real in your houses. But I hope that you can hear me say, as somebody who has been on the other side and read many, many applications and sat in admissions committee meetings where people talk about what classes somebody has access to and the context of the environment in which they're learning and what aptitude, all of this is, whether your <coughs> child takes AP Physics C or not in high school is not going to be determinative of anything other than that they have taken AP Physics C as a senior in high school. I want to fix these problems. I'm really not trying to minimize. What I am trying to do is just say the little, the little piece of this that I have professional experience in, like I, I, would, I want you to know that so that you sleep better at night. Uh, we're not, we can't take uh, commentary from the audience at this point. Um, we do need to move on. Superintendent's report? Do you have anything you wanted to ask? Oh, I, I just have oh, one final ask. Um, I know that Ms. Bronner and Dr. Jenger have been in some initial conversations around um, possible scholarship support mm -hmm. during the summer. Can you just briefly share that? Well, you kind of said it. No. Um, <laughs> so one of the things thinking about to, to try to increase access, and it's not perfect, right? Like we're still looking at what are other options um, for students going into to next year, thinking like we got to start thinking about what do those look like now so they can plan for them. But one of them was to provide scholarships to students. So if the barrier to taking a summer course in pre-calculus is financial, we can support the student through that. Um, the, you know, with the time aspect, that's not something yet, but we're looking at that in the other creative ways um, that we can support them getting that credit. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you all. Please, please go home, get some sleep. You've got, uh, you a, got uh, a big job tomorrow morning. Finance report, actually. Finance report, Mr. Gorski. Oy, okay, hold on, wait. I don't have that up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you start, and I'll find. Okay. Thank you, Chair um, and committee. So as part of the initial budget report for school committee for FY25, I will be sharing data on the general fund grants and revolving accounts. Um, with the account code revision that the district implemented last year with the assistance of the town controller, there's an opportunity to review the financial information through the lens, through a lens that aligns with both the way we build our budget and the way we report the financial information to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, as part of our annual end of the year financial report submission. As we go through the budget reports, it will be helpful to get the school committee's feedback um, on any proposed changes. The goal is to build out this information so it becomes more transparent and is more available in real time to school committee and others who would find it useful. And ultimately building, um, you know, as I say, real time data and dashboards would be the goal, um, hopefully to get there this year. The other item that I'd like to highlight for the committee in reviewing the budget reports is that we have some data cleanup to do in the business office. Um, probably not surprising with staffing last year, um, particularly at the point when the budget was being finalized. Uh, the arrival of the finance director, Tam Tran, who starts a week from today. We're very excited to have him in the business office and I think he will be a um, valuable member both from the administration and for the district, uh, as a background as a deputy CFO and also as a data director. Um, some of the adjustments are related to how the budget was loaded into Munis, as I mentioned. An example of this is the $1.2 million that was set aside for the collective bargaining increase for our teachers, uh, which needs to be adjusted in Munis. There are also negative lines under special education related to the timing of the IDA grant uh, being approved and how the district handles circuit breaker funding. 
On the latter, I'm going to make uh, propose making changes in the way we handle circuit breaker for FY26 and going forward. Uh, I may touch upon that right now. I mentioned, I discuss uh, in the memo I mentioned in further detail later, but essentially what the district has done historically is taken tuitions and charged them to the general fund and then later in the year charged them off, uh, transferred them off the general fund to circuit breaker. We tend to do a lot of transfers in the business office. I think to minimize that, I would propose us charging salaries. One of the reasons why we wait later in the year um, to do those transfers, particularly when it comes to tuition, is there's two, two rationales. Why? Uh, one is because some of those tuition costs, those purchase orders get closed out. In Circuit Breaker, we typically we have the ability, we receive the revenue in one fiscal year. We could spend it if we needed to. And in a sense, it act, acts like a sped stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. But districts typically, and guidance from ASVO is to use that circuit breaker funding received in a given year as part of budgeting. And then you have the following year to spend the funds. Mm -hmm. So it's a source of funds in the following year. Um, but it has to be spent down by the end of that following year. So again, if you're, you're doing tuitions, you have this closeout process that's inevitable based upon uh, the cohort of students, and then you could potentially have some challenges there at the end with circuit breaker. So uh, I think there may be a, an opportunity to, uh, to look at that, revising how the district handles that. The other thing that's not part of my memo that I want to mention um, when the committee looks at these budget reports, typically you're going to see payroll encumbrances. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see them on these reports. Part of the rationale behind that is um, <coughs> the payroll office is waiting for all staff to be loaded into Munis. And at about the time that encumbrances would have happened, our payroll manager went out on leave and continues to be on leave. Mm -hmm. So that's something that will be adjusted going forward. So just a quick <coughs> kind of table set as I go through these reports. Um, the following reports contain actual expenditures and encumbrances through October 31st, um, based upon a year-to-day budget report and also based upon a payroll file uh, from November 1st. The general fund expenditure report by object code, this is a report that school committee has typically utilized to review expenditures. Um, as I mentioned, the year-to-day budget report uh, which is run out of Munis. Um, the budget column reflects the amount approved by the school committee for the FY25 budget. There's a transfer column which reflects any budget transfers processed between accounts as of the report ending date. It can also reflect other activities such as a carry forward purchase order. Then there's, the revi there's a revised budget column which includes the approved budget and any transfer activity. The expended column reflects actual expenditures posted in Munis as of the reporting date, in this case, 10-31-24. There's an encumbered column which reflects actual encumbrances posted in Munis as of 10-31-24. Um, for, for the committee and for others, the encumbrances, we've, we've entered a requisition. We're putting money aside for a particular um, item uh, whether it's a, a service or a good, and the expenditure is when we actually make payment. Mm -hmm. Projected expenditures column reflects anticipated spending that will post the munis from 11 one through the close of the fiscal year. Um, the methodology includes the assumption that all schools and departments will fully expend their FY25 budget amount. This is in reference to their non-payroll items, and the payroll expenditures are projected out based upon the number of remaining payrolls after 11 one One thing that I want to point out when we're looking at the, when we get down into the, the numbers themselves, the projected columns, the way the projection runs has some negative numbers in it. I will correct that. They're being pulled into the bottom line, but it looks a little funky in the report. Um, the general fund expenditure report by department and object. Um, this is the report that I'm talking about uh, asking the school committee to possibly look at the expenditures through this lens with the revision <coughs> of the chart of accounts that more closely align 
with the DESI reporting codes, we're able to report by school or department broken down by these categories. And they include the following, professional salaries, clerical salaries, other salaries, contracted services, supplies and materials, and other expenses. Uh, and then we have, finally on the general fund side, there's a general fund expenditure report by school and department, and this is looking at non-payroll numbers. There's a grant report, which includes, uh, this report reflects both entitlement and competitive grants that the district has been awarded and the corresponding revenue expenditures and encumbrances through 103124. There's a multi-year aspect there, which um, I can talk through as we get to that report. And then there's the revolving funds report. This report reflects the budget amount, actual expenditures and encumbrances as of 103124. It includes the projected expending and anticipated balances at the end of the fiscal year. And then finally, there's the budget transfer categories uh, school committee approves the budget based upon transfer categories, including the following, administration, curriculum, and instruction, elementary education, other, secondary education, and special education. So going into the, the numbers itself, again, the initial report is the, the report that school committee is, um, typically looks at, the report by object. I'm gonna highlight a couple of things for the committee. As I mentioned, um, when looking at the, uh, the salary piece, um, there's the $1.2 million that in the load and munis needs to be distributed among accounts and get loaded into an admin account. So that's something that will be corrected. Um, in talking with the superintendent about this report, in looking at the, um, the teacher salary line, which is that second line shown on the, here in the report, you're looking at a budget number of just under 56 million, but when you look at the budget book for FY25, there's a number that's higher than that. <coughs> there is a reason for that. We have um, about 1.3 million uh, <coughs> worth of salaries for our teachers, which are charging to grants. So in the budget book, there is an all funds approach, which is showing the general fund grants and revolving account coming up to a budget number of about 102 million for the current year when our actual general fund budget number is around 96 million. Um, we have some lines, if we can scroll down um, to... Where do you want me to go? Yeah. Uh, the second page, 50, the object code, it's, at, it's also the second row of the following page, uh, object code 510326. I wanted to point this out for two reasons. One, there's no budget associated with this expenditure, but also in talking about the Munis cleanup, you'll notice that the description is sped summer school party. In my investigation, taking a look at the budgetary number, I found out there's actually, there isn't summer school at Hardy. Nope. So this is, and there hasn't been for years. Um, this is just something that needs to be cleaned up in the system. But I pointed out, and this is actually a, there are summer school that was held at Pierce, Pierce Gibbs, uh, the preschool mm -hmm. and the high school. Yeah, this exactly. number encompasses all of those expenditures. Um, there's not budget under the object code associated with it, but it is covered within the special education budget. Mr. Chairman, we should move to 10 o'clock or 10 I was thinking that. We're, well, that we're six would... minutes off, so you, were, you would like to move to suspend the rules until? 10.30. Until 10.30. A motion by Mr. Thielman to suspend the 10 o'clock rule until 10.30, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. I assume that's why your hand went up. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That's a two-thirds vote, so we're suspended. Go ahead, keep going. Where else do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually we'll, make we'll a keep suggestion? Scrolling through. Yeah. So that, um, I mean, it's very late. There's a lot of numbers yes. here. We didn't really have a lot of time to look at it. I would post, pr propose tabling this to our next meeting, mm -hmm. the rest of this report. Second. <laughs> I still think we have to kind of. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion to table, which uh, is not just okay, uh, debatable. <laughs> and second, motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by. Uh, uh, Ms. Morgan to table 
until the next, uh, to table this, uh, which is not a date certain, but I would assume it would come up at the next meeting. That's the motion. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yeah. Opposed? Uh, that is a unanimous vote, so we've now tabled the budget. Okay. My turn. Uh, superintendent. All right. I will be quick. Um, and as part of my superintendent's update, since we've uh, tabled something, mm -hmm. ask that any feedback um, on updates to the finance report be sent to myself and Mr. Gorski, and feedback mm -hmm. as well, because there are some new formats on there. Yeah. And we would well, love to hear your thoughts well, um, and answer your questions. We'll also be discussing it the next budget. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So very quickly, we had our professional learning day last Tuesday. Uh, we started with a welcome from the Arlington High School P Combined Choirs, welcoming our teachers to their day of professional learning. They started with a video talking about the collaborative work of education, students talking about uh, what that phrase, it takes a village, really means and what it's meant to them in their uh, educational experiences. If you'll recall, our theme for the year was around uh, connections that foster growth. And it, that was followed by a live performance of the song, It Takes a Village, which was a surprise for our educators. So they did, we showed the video and then the curtains parted and went up and uh, there were the kids and they sang this song, it was beautiful. Uh, we also had a keynote from Dr. Jill Berg. She's been doing work with the district for 10 years mm -hmm. um, and she's a, a dear colleague of mine. I've worked with her for six years, two districts now. Um, she was, she's done a ton of research. She writes for ASCD and Educational Leadership Magazine about um, teacher leadership and collaboration, and she did a keynote on the research behind building connections that impact student learning outcomes, and it was fantastic um, and very engaging and intellectual and awesome for our educators. We then had departmental meetings and instructionally focused building meetings. Um, I do wanna say everyone's, and you've seen some evidence of that tonight, everyone's focus is laserly on classroom and instruction and student experience this year, and it's been really exciting, and I think our professional learning day was one example of that. Another example of that is that we have launched instructional rounds today, actually, um, for our administrators. This is something we did in uh, my first two years uh, in Arlington Public Schools. Last year, we did a bit of a hiatus to do some redesign of instructional rounds. This year, they're back. Um, we're doing 32 different sets of rounds during the school year. We only, last time we did these, we only did eight. Um, but this year we're doing 32. They kicked off this week at Audison. All administrators are required to attend at least four sets of rounds. Um, in between rounds, we're doing professional development around uh, lenses for effective instruction. We're using tools to sort of norm around what we consider high quality instruction that develops inquiry and challenge. Um, and all buildings and core area directors and several elective area directors are hosting the rounds. They have a common template that they use to uh, structure the time. Um, and they're in smaller groups because we're doing 32 sets of them. Uh, admins attend, like I said, those learning sessions on facilitative leadership and high quality feedback in between rounds weeks with the idea being that they bring what they take from those rounds into those learning opportunities and they can use those as case studies uh, in their learning. So we're really excited about that. I did wanna give a brief update on MCAS question two. This was uh, passed in the recent election with a yes vote, which eliminated the competency determination uh, for graduation from high school. Um, I don't have a lot of details on this yet, but I just wanted to address it because I know it's been on people's minds. We've had educators ask about it. So MCAS is, I just, one thing that I think was a, um, a bit of a myth I heard a bit is that this would get rid of MCAS, it does not. So I just wanna clearly state that MCAS is still taking place in grades three to eight and 10. Um, that high school MCAS is still very important for accountability at the school level, uh, for scholarships, for district and school planning, um, for monitoring achievement against standards at the student level as well, and for, like, like I said, scholarships. I mean, students still submit scores on MCAS to colleges. Um, they may still submit that as one of the qualifying criteria for a scholarship to college. So we're still doing this. It's still important to us, and we're, our messaging hasn't changed. Do your best. Um, come having eaten breakfast and slept well. And it does give us a lot of important data points is still what we're held accountable to at the state level. Um, we're still waiting for further information from the state, but we do know that the official sort of enactment of the um, provision takes place on December 5th, and we'll get more information about what local determination means and what we might wanna consider uh, as a school system, which could have implications for program of studies if you wanted to reconsider what that local requirement might be or look like. 
Um, we did launch the FY26 budget development process. Uh, administrators are crafting budget proposals right now. They've, like I said earlier, been asked to consider supportive staffing models for inclusion and access to high quality instruction in their proposals and to work together on those. Um, and they've been asked to keep a couple of things in mind. One is stable to decreasing enrollment at the elementary level. Uh, another is the steadily increasing enrollment at the secondary level as well as some of the other priorities we talked about this evening. I have sent you a number of enrollment updates, including the October 1 numbers. Uh, we have 115 additional students compared to October 1, 2023. Not quite what our projections had told us was gonna be happening at this point. Um, and so we've, and part of that is that we've had some movement uh, at the secondary level and some stre uh, strengthening retention rates across the district. Uh, we do have new internal projections that were recalculated using an FY25 five-year weighted average. Our most recent ones were 22. So these are certainly stronger in that they're taking into account enrollment trends over the last few years. And we're evaluating quotes for vendor projections for external enrollment projections that we might be able to use to make some decisions moving forward. And that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Any questions for the superintendent? Ms. Morgan. Um, do we, I know that this came up a little bit when we were looking ahead towards long range plan and enrollment. Um, there are a, an extraordinary number of new high school students yes. that have arrived here. Do, do we have yeah. any anecdotal information about who I've, these humans are? Is that something that potentially we could figure out? Because goodness gracious, like we have like 19 new kids that showed up for 11th grade. Yeah, if we, so I have theories and I, I, I don't want, want you, I, mean, I don't want like, to say them. I don't want you to <laughs> speculate. I don't, like, right. I don't, I right. mean, I, I, and so, I probably won't know before however many hours from now. Of course not. No, no, no. Yeah, I know we're all going to be there in 10 hours. <laughs> no, I am in the future. I am curious look into it. about mm -hmm. given that you talked about the enrollment update about all of these new humans that have shown up in 10th, especially in 10th, 11th, 10th and 11th grades. And guidance must have information. They have to look at their oh, yeah. transcripts. They, they yeah. certainly yeah. will know. So yes. and if we could get a couple of you have asked me that in the last like 24 hours. So I will definitely look into it and find out. Thank you. Okay, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted <coughs> by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence, warrant 25106 <coughs> in the amount of $935,045.38, dated November 5th, and the school committee meeting minutes from October 24th. Motion to approve the consent agenda from Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded from Mr. Thielman. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Subcommittee liaison reports budget. So we met yesterday. We had an update on the FY24 and FY25 budgets. We discussed budget process for FY26, and you'll find the budget calendar in Novus underneath uh, the committee updates. Um, and we discussed just sort of big picture thinking in terms of getting ready for tomorrow's long range plan meeting. And uh, we heard some updates on rental fees and those are still in process, but looks. Obviously the, the question has arise tonight, will we need to change our policy regarding defining line items in the future, given the discussion that our assistant superintendent for finance is starting? Because we, 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 we define we, line, we have to approve budget transfers for line items, and we state what the line items are within the policy. Yeah, we haven't approached that yet. We haven't had a right. proposal to change that. So no. No, uh, no, 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 no reason to as of now. No. Just sort of a heads up is that that might be where that discussion was going. Yeah. Okay, because if we change the way we structure the budget and what the line item is, we then have to go to policy. Curriculum instruction assessment, or uh, community relations, rather, Ms. Exton. No report. Uh, can I ask if we are looking to do any more community forms? Not in the way that they have been done before. Okay. S uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. We met on November 4th. Uh, 
which was last week, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about priority one. Um, Dr. Homan reviewed that for us and some of the work they're doing uh, along with Dr. Ford Walker. Um, we discussed the history graduation requirements that were part of the program of studies with the history department chair. Um, and we did had a rousing conversation about secondary level class sizes. Mm -hmm. It was a good time. And 11 new students in 11th grade. Yeah, we want to know where all those kids came from. Yeah, Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we met on Tuesday. P file BEDH will finally be coming for the next meeting for first read. Um, regarding the evaluation of the superintendent, the policy is, is flexible. We had a, a discussion about um, whether skipping the year is the best approach or other ways to simplify the process are the best approach. So I think as we complete our round of evaluations this year, mm -hmm. um, I'm still working on mine, uh, we should think about what we're getting out of that and do we wanna skip a year or do we wanna take some other measure? Um, one, one thing we, we discussed was how we already have the district goals and I, most of us wanna hear a report mm -hmm. on the district goals annually, Will that be, would that be enough? Um, to do a superintendent evaluation based on just the district goals and not have her separate goals, different ways we can look at. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to make sure before we did a lot of work whether there was consensus of the committee to willingness of the committee to explore that. Is that a question you're sort yes. of asking right now? Is yeah. the committee open to some sort of a formative assessment on <coughs> odd numbered years or some uh, abbreviated evaluation process? We're collapsing a yeah, district or collapsing other ways to sort of other ways lo lo looking for a way to simplify it the every process other year. and not necessarily do use, a, for, a yeah. full formal evaluation every two years and do something else in between. Um, and everybody not, me it, is comfortable it, with the current form where you begin at the back and go. Oh no, no, I agree with you. <laughs> oh, okay. I just hadn't looked at it yet. <laughs> oh, okay. When you say skipping a year, can you say more? <laughs> Well, I mean, there are some superintendents after you're just, it's, it's like the like sixth the grade bypass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there are some superintendents that after their third year, um, you know, they sort of like reach professional status mm -hmm. and they get a formal evaluation every two years. They do two year goals instead of one year goals. We sort of thought maybe a different way to save work would be to simplify the goals um, and not have this big body of evidence that she has to collect every year. So I think there are different ways of approaching it, um, and I think the issue is more before we actually spend a lot of work doing it, if everybody is super happy with what we're doing, then we'll just keep what we're doing. But I, I think there's, is, are there enough of us that are open to change? The superintendent's graded in large part on the district's goals and the achievement right. of those goals. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess I'm just like, I, I'm not comfortable with skipping a year, I guess I would suggest something like the goals are a two-year goals mm -hmm. and we would evaluate her every other year yeah. on those goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, so they wouldn't, but there wouldn't be like a year without any right. thing, I yeah. guess. I, I would just like to see yeah. the goals. We'll get into the, so we'll get into the okay. details. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But people are open to us having a conversation about discussing this. That's no. I mean, I'm just oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Go I ahead, Ms. Yeah. Morgan. As somebody who is not on this subcommittee and has no interest in joining any new subcommittee, <laughs> I'm actively trying to get out of the subcommittees I am on. Um, when you become chair next year, you can yep. go and define that. Yep. Uh, none for me, please. Um, <laughs> I, it seems like it's maybe a conversation that needs to happen. At full, like I, I don't know. Yeah. No. Like, I think we need to explore it more and then sure. present some options to the full committee. Okay. Yeah. But the yeah, question is, before like we did that, little, before like, we did that work, I feel a little. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm always come to our next meeting. No. See, that's what I, <laughs> that's what I want. To do. I, I get it. I get it. I think I. We've and got Ms. Morgan orders. does the best meeting. Is there anybody who objects to the subcommittee exactly. going down to this process? That's the right way. To Seeing look at no it. objection, <laughs> go explore. <laughs> um, Facilities. Uh, we did policies. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We're having conversations about some of the end of project work that has to be done using the contingency we think will be available. And uh, so that's great conversation taking place with the district leadership and the high school leadership about some things that have been identified. 
In other words, you've extracted a lot of value from your value engineering and you're looking to put the value back into the building. Yes, I don't want to overpromise though. How much <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just. Uh, that, that's a right word. That's very clever phrasing. I'm yeah. just translating it into jargon. Yes. <laughs> another, bi another bike rack. Uh, that came up. Oh, yes. That came up. Mr. Korsky has solved all of your field problems, though, so we're very lucky. There's oh, good. There's a plan in place for mm -hmm. that. So. Wait, no, <laughs> actually, he's that outstanding in the field. Did you know that? No, I'm just guessing. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. All yes. Uh, liaison reports. First of all, at fiscal 25 APS budget calendar is sitting on this list? I don't know it's, why. It's supposed to be under the committees. Okay. That's. It's supposed to be under budget. It's okay. just... It's for your. It, it, it floated here. Announce uh, liaison reports. Any that liaison was my reports? Sorry. Mm. That was me. Sorry. I don't. It doesn't matter. We're flexible. We're a good committee. Announcements, future agenda items. Uh, Mr. Spiegel, do we need an executive session? Please, God. <laughs> I, I don't think so. We do need to schedule. We'll work on scheduling a meeting um, with one of the. Uh, bargaining subcommittees and I'll work with Ms. Diggins on that. Okay, we can tra la la past the uh, executive session, which means that at um, 10, 11 p.m. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Move. Second. Ms. Second. Morgan, second by uh, Mr. Thielman. Yep. Uh, all in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. We meet on we December 5th, right? ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.